Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit worldafropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. Worldafropedia.com. Coming up, a discussion on possible reparations to African Americans for slavery. A panel including Congressman John Conyers. Black lawmakers resentful after Conyers' resignation by John Bresnahan. The stunning fall of Democratic Representative John Conyers, who resigned Tuesday amid a growing sexual harassment scandal, has left confusion, anger, resentment, and bewilderment inside the ranks of the Congressional Black Caucus, a group that Conyers helped found nearly four decades ago. Many CBC members see a double standard at play. They won't say the treatment of Conyers is racist, necessarily, and all express strong support for his alleged victims— but they think white politicians accused of similar misconduct, like Blake Farenthold, Al Franken, Roy Moore, and Donald Trump, get a benefit of the doubt that black politicians don't enjoy. Some members believe House Minority Leader Nancy Pelosi, Democrat California, and other party leaders moved too quickly in calling on Conyers to resign and should have let the process play out more, although they understand the pressure she was facing. And still another faction thinks Conyers' declining health and mental acuity after more than 52 years in Congress led to the debacle, despite evidence that Conyers allegedly had been harassing female staffers for years. There is also significant anger within the CBC aimed at one of their own, Representative Sheila Jackson Lee, Democrat, Texas. Conyers was going to announce his retirement from Congress last Friday. Then Monica Conyers, the congressman's wife, and Jackson Lee got involved and stopped it from happening, said several Democratic lawmakers and aides. That decision dragged out the controversy for five days, although the delay ultimately allowed Conyers to endorse his son, John Conyers III, for his seat. Ian Conyers, the congressman's grandnephew, and a Michigan state senator also may run, setting off an intra-family battle. Certainly it seems as if there is indeed a double standard, said Representative Marsha Fudge, Democrat Ohio, who was involved in Conyers' retirement negotiations last week before Jackson Lee and Monica Conyers derailed them. When it happens to one of us, we're guilty until proven innocent. They're just finally starting to talk about Blake Farenthold, who is a member sitting here who paid out $84,000. A former Farenthold aide, Lauren Green, received that settlement payment after filing a lawsuit against the Texas Republican claiming gender discrimination and a hostile workplace, with sexual harassment a key part of that claim. Do I think he was treated like everyone? No, he wasn't. I think it was an easy call for people to talk about him, added Representative Cedric Richmond, Democrat Louisiana, CBC chairman. You didn't see Speaker Ryan calling for the resignation of Blake Farenthold, who settled a case. Conyers denies it. Franken admits it. Franken, a Democratic senator from Minnesota, has been accused of inappropriately touching or attempting to forcibly kiss six women. Franken is now under ethics investigation, but has refused to resign. It's a horrible situation, and if the allegations are true, then retirement or resignation was appropriate, Richmond added. The problem for me was I had the congressman vehemently denying it, and I have very credible-sounding victims. When the deal goes down, 
John isn't well. He was beginning to suffer memory loss, and physically he isn't well, said Representative Alcee Hastings, Democrat Florida, who faced an ethics investigation and lawsuit over sexual harassment five years ago, both of which were later dismissed. But sure, there are members of the Congressional Black Caucus who feel John was done in. I respect that, but I don't have that feeling. Conyers allegedly harassed several former aides, including an ex-staffer who received a $27,000 settlement using taxpayer funds. After initially seeming to downplay the allegations against him, Pelosi quickly changed course, and by Thursday she was calling for Conyers to resign. Representative Jim Clyde, Democrat, South Carolina, the highest-ranking black lawmaker in Congress, also called on Conyers to resign, a huge blow to the Michigan Democrat. But Conyers, who had been hospitalized for stress-related symptoms, refused to leave office initially, and there were signs he intended to try to fight off an ethics committee investigation. Congressman Conyers has served in the Congress for more than five decades and shaped some of the most consequential legislation of the last half century, Pelosi said in a statement. But no matter how great the legacy, it is no license to harass or discriminate. This was as much about Pelosi's own politics as it was about Conyers, said a CBC member, speaking on the condition of anonymity. I think she was forced into it, and I think it was very unfortunate. Pelosi has come under fire for not taking a harder line against Conyers from the start, especially amid a broader push across the country to crack down on sexual harassment and assault. Yet Richmond, for his part, doesn't blame Pelosi. I don't think she was unfair to him, Richmond said. Part of it was unfortunately he got sick and went into the hospital and couldn't defend himself. But only he knows and the victims know what happened. Looking at the amount of victims, it was troubling, and there was no way around it. Behind the scenes, there was an attempt to end this controversy last week, yet it fell apart under pressure from Monica Conyers and Jackson Lee. According to lawmakers and aides, Fudge had brokered an arrangement that would save some face for Conyers while removing a big problem for Democrats. After some delicate negotiations, Fudge was going to read a letter on the House floor last Friday, announcing Conyers would retire at the end of December. By calling it retirement and not resignation, the move would give Conyers a last shred of dignity, said one source familiar with the discussions. Conyers would have time to clean out his Capitol Hill and Detroit offices. In return, Conyers would avoid an investigation by the House Ethics Committee that could lead to censure or expulsion. Then Jackson Lee and Monica Conyers weighed in against the deal, and it was taken off the table, dragging out the scandal, said the sources. People are furious with her, one CBC member said of Jackson Lee, absolutely furious. When asked about her interactions with Monica Conyers, Jackson Lee said she cannot comment on anything involving Mr. Conyers. I am not Mr. Conyers. Jackson Lee added, I have not spoken with Mr. Conyers. I have nothing to do with his decision. Jackson Lee would not discuss any conversation with Monica Conyers, who has emerged as a key player in the saga. Monica Conyers was seen by CBC members and Democratic aides as the driving force behind Conyers' refusal to resign. Some lawmakers even speculate that Monica Conyers was trying to position herself or one of her sons to run for the seat, which is what eventually happened. Monica Conyers berated reporters staking out the family home in Detroit last week. Do you all go and stalk other people's houses, she asked reporters, according to the Detroit Free Press. Do you go and stalk white people's houses or just come to the black neighborhoods and stalk our houses? The couple met when Monica Conyers was an aide on his campaign in the late 1980s. They were married in 1990 and have two children. She was elected to the Detroit City Council in 2005. In 2009, Monica Conyers pleaded guilty to conspiracy to commit bribery in connection with a Detroit sludge hauling scandal. As a member of the city council two years earlier, she cast the deciding vote in favor of awarding a $1.2 billion contract to Sinegro Technologies. She ended up serving 27 months in federal prison in West Virginia. The fact is, Anderson, we got two cultures down here, white culture and the colored culture. Now, that's the way it always has been. That's the way it always will be. The rest of America don't see it that way, Mr. Mayor. The rest of America don't mean jack shit. 
You in Mississippi now. President Trump is drawing criticism from civil rights groups who are upset about his weekend plans. The president is scheduled to be in Jackson, Mississippi tomorrow when the state opens a civil rights museum as part of bicentennial events. Mississippi is the setting for a key chapter in the nation's struggle for equality. But the state has been slow to acknowledge the racism and violence in its past. The new museum now tells that difficult story. NPR's Debbie Elliott has a preview. Okay, everybody come on in. As construction workers put up the last exhibits, Mississippi Civil Rights Museum director Pamela Jr. shows a small group the developing galleries. This is the beginning. Africans coming over through the transatlantic slave trade. We journey through the Emancipation Proclamation and Reconstruction. Then a turn into a room dominated by a tree, its limbs sprawling overhead. This tree here is a lot of symbolism to me because we're walking into some deep times now. And it's not only you see, uh, think about the tree and lynching, but you look at the images, Jim Crow images that are up as leaves are on the limbs of the trees. This is when it starts getting dark. Let's go on in a little bit. Junior says visitors will experience cramped and dark spaces as they move through the museum's galleries. The movement was very uncomfortable. I want them to feel uncomfortable so they can understand that once they get out of this tunnel, that they're going to come to light. And their challenge is to make Mississippi the best Mississippi that they can. Junior says they will encourage visitors to leave the museum and then travel around the state to learn more at key historical sites. And there are plenty. Bryant's Grocery, where Emmett Till was fatefully accused of flirting with a white shopkeeper. Voting rights activist Fannie Lou Hamer's grave. And the Neshoba County Memorial to three civil rights workers killed by the Ku Klux Klan during Freedom Summer. Mississippi's ground zero when it comes to civil rights. State Senator Hillman Frazier of Jackson was instrumental in getting legislation passed for the new museum and served on the planning committee. It was a long time coming, he says. Folks thought that uh, we should forget about it, part of history, don't tell the story, and just uh, don't bring up anything that is painful. But that's part of our history. Civil rights tourism has taken off in other states. For instance, in Alabama, where the Birmingham Civil Rights Institute and the Rosa Parks Museum in Montgomery are a big draw. In 2006, Republican Governor Haley Barber helped push the Mississippi project forward, seeing the economic benefit. But to secure funding from the legislature, Frazier says the Civil Rights Museum was paired with a state history museum, giving lawmakers political cover to approve it. Some just didn't want to vote for a straight-up Civil Rights Museum because of this district they represent, and they just didn't want to bring those issues up. State officials reject the idea that the dual museums represent a continuation of the separate but equal doctrine and say they complement one another. Set in downtown Jackson near the state archives, the two buildings are joined by a common lobby. The History Museum gives a broad overview. The Civil War transformed Mississippi. It spans from the Stone Age and Native American cultures through the Great Mississippi River flood of 1927 to Hurricane Katrina. The Civil Rights Museum brings a deeper focus to the 30-year period when Mississippi was at the center of the movement. Foot soldiers have donated artifacts, including the family of murdered Hattiesburg NAACP leader Vernon Damer. He was targeted for offering to pay the poll tax for African Americans who wanted to vote. Damer was killed in 1966 when the KKK firebombed his home and surrounded it, waiting to shoot to death anyone who tried to escape the burning house. That was a horrible night. Ellie Damer is Vernon Damer's 92-year-old widow. She says she never thought she'd see it documented in a museum. We lived it, and some of them died with it. The rest of Mississippi needs to know about it. Museum director Pamela Jr. shows the family a photograph of the four oldest sons who returned from the military after their father was killed. They're standing by the remains of the family home. You see the brothers, all with uniforms on, and what do I say? I say that his sons were fighting for America, and Mr. Damon was here in Mississippi fighting to be an American. This is amazing. Amazing piece right here. Amazing. So Vernon Damer Jr. stops to gather himself when he sees the picture. Yeah, that was a tough day. Yeah. 
yeah. you know, to have to come home and, and look at where we were raised and uh, reflect back on the memories of growing up. Mm-hmm. And it didn't need to happen. He's moved by the museum's treatment of Mississippi's brutal past. We've come a long way, and it's something that we can all be proud of. We've got a long way to go. So today I stand here, and I'm very, very proud and very pleased what I've been able to see. His brother Dennis Danger was 11 at the time. What they did to send the message to terrorize black folks and people sympathetic to black folks. Despite a confession from one of the Klansmen, it was more than 30 years before Mississippi convicted a KKK grand wizard for Damer's murder. Ellie Damer says progress has been slow, and it's up to white people now to see it through. If as many of them will stand as the blacks stood in 66, we'll see a change in Mississippi. But you all are going to have to take a stand. We've already stood. Now a new controversy has developed after Republican Governor Phil Bryant invited President Trump to the museum's opening. Georgia Congressman John Lewis, a Democrat and civil rights icon, has canceled his plans to participate in Saturday's dedication. Lewis and Mississippi Democratic Congressman Benny Thompson say it's an insult for Trump to be there given his response to white nationalist rallies and other racially divisive comments. Governor Bryant is rejecting calls to revoke the invitation. Well, that's just sad. Uh, the President of the United States should be able, and, and we're very thankful that he is, going to come for this historic occasion. This is Bryant says the President will honor Mississippi with his presence. Debbie Elliott, NPR News, Jackson. I want to be a cop. Because you're white male privilege, so you wouldn't know. I'm sorry? I'm sorry. White male privilege. Tonight, the Plainfield police captain that said those words is staying on the job after a decision from the police board. The story has sparked national headlines, some calling the comments racist. Call 6 Investigates Paris Lobel has been following the story from the beginning. He was at that meeting tonight in Paris. This is not the first time that this officer has been in trouble. That's right, Raphael. She was actually disciplined and demoted earlier this year. Captain Carrie Weber uh, violated the department's alcohol policy. And now this is the second investigation into her conduct. But tonight, she's keeping keeping her job. After finding Captain Weber to be fit for duty, I move that she be removed from administrative leave and return to her present position and job responsibilities. The decision coming from the Plainfield Police Commissioners after Captain Carrie Weber was placed on administrative leave in November for this comment. Because you're white male privilege, so you wouldn't know. The city says the comment came during a transgender awareness training session the department was going through by the U.S. Department of Justice. After another officer in the room questioned statistics that transgender people are more likely to experience police violence compared to non-transgender people. Most of the people that I know have never been accused of police of violence. So I guess I don't get where that statistic comes from. That male officer, later identified by the city as Captain Scott Arnett, filed a complaint against Weber and she was placed on administrative leave. But because Weber had already been suspended for two weeks earlier this year for violating the department's alcohol policy by driving her department-issued squad car after drinking at a golf outing and transporting alcohol inside the vehicle, it was up to the police commissioners to make the decision on her future with the department. Meeting of the Plainfield Metropolitan Police Commissioner's Board. That decision coming Thursday night in a packed room at Plainfield Police Headquarters. Supporters from both sides of the issue were there as the decision was made. He was arguing against the statistics, saying, you know, transgender people aren't discriminated against. And I know that that's true, not true. I know that, you know, my friends are afraid of the police. Plainfield Police Department has um, exonerated her for this and does not believe that there's a situation for dismissal from the force. I totally disagree with that. In my opinion, she's a racist, and there's no room in our public and our society for that. Uh, Raphael, Captain Carrie Weber was reprimanded. A note was placed in her file for disrupting the training session and improper handling of an uh, issue with a subordinate. Now, Captain Scott Arnett, the male in that incident, was also disciplined earlier this month. He received a two-day suspension. So what is the department saying about this now? Raphael, they're saying they just want to move forward. They regret the situation occurred, but they're looking forward to that resolution. But Paris LaBelle leading our coverage tonight. Thank you so much. When you're a cop, you can torment freely and see me valley, then seize an Audi, then being proudly, turn a routine traffic stop. To your season finale when you're a cop. As you heard here last month, the San Joaquin County Sheriff is being accused of abusing his office to influence death investigations. 
including hiding evidence in order to shield law enforcement officers. KQED's Julie Small has an update and a warning. The story is graphic. The county's chief forensic pathologist, Dr. Bennett Omalu, is alleging a pattern of abuse in which the sheriff has interfered with his work and disregarded the findings of autopsies. The nationally recognized pathologist wrote notes detailing his concerns about Sheriff Coroner Steve Moore. He wrote that the sheriff had withheld information, and in three cases involving people who died either in custody or during arrest, Moore certified the death as an accident instead of a homicide, as Amalo believes the medical findings indicated. The sheriff does whatever he feels like doing as the coroner, in total disregard of bioethics, standards of practice of medicine, and the generally accepted principles of medicine, Omalu wrote in an August memo presented to the county administration yesterday. The county district attorney said her office is looking into the allegations. Omalu's colleague, Dr. Susan Parson, quit her job with the county last week, saying she had lost faith in the ability to work independently. Both doctors declined to be recorded for this story, but asked Patricia Hernandez with the Union of American Physicians and Dentists to speak for them. If this was something that was made public, I think that many citizens would question it and would demand change. Sheriff Moore is an elected official, and as in 49 other counties, he serves as both the top law enforcement officer and the county coroner. He denies the claim that he meddled in forensic investigations. As coroner, I have not interfered. I've never changed any cause of death, he told KQED yesterday. Moore also declined to be recorded. He said determining cause of death, what killed a person, is the purview of the forensic pathologist. By law, his job as the coroner is to determine the manner, whether the death is an accident, a homicide, a suicide, a result of natural causes, or undetermined. Moore said, I do that based on the totality of the circumstances, up to and including the autopsy report provided by the doctor and the investigative report done by the coroner's investigators. But doctors Omalu and Parson allege the sheriff's department kept them from visiting crime scenes to gather information needed for independent analysis, then didn't turn over investigatory reports. Again, Pat Hernandez. It's very important for the sheriff to be transparent and to provide the information that the doctors need. Otherwise, they cannot conduct their work. In one of the more graphic details, the doctors both complained about a sheriff sergeant who went behind their backs and ordered forensic technicians to cut the hands off at least five bodies for fingerprinting, something they said is done only rarely for badly decomposed bodies. The sheriff told us his department needed to send the hands to a special lab for help with identification, but the doctor said it was not necessary in these cases. Omalu went so far as to claim systematic bias, flaws, and corruption, and he alleges the sheriff failed to share some key evidence in the case of a father who died after a police chase. It was only reported that he was tased twice, and in reality he was tased 31 times. There's a big difference in that, and I'm not sure how that can be overlooked or swept under a carpet like it was. I'll have more on that part of the story tomorrow. For the California Report, I'm Julie Small. When we first heard on the television that a police officer had gunned down an unarmed African-American in North Charleston by the name of Walter Scott, there were some who said, wow, Uh, the national story has come home to South Carolina. But there were many who said there is no way that a police officer would ever shoot somebody in the back six, seven, eight times. But like Thomas, when we were able to see the video and we were able to see the gunshots and when we saw him fall to the ground and when we saw the police officer come and handcuff him on the ground, without even trying to resuscitate him, without even seeing if he was really alive, without calling an ambulance, without calling for help, and to see him die face down in the ground as if he were gunned down like game. I believe we all were like Thomas and said, I believe. 
20 years, that was the sentence handed down to former North Jackson police officer Michael Slager today. We have team coverage tonight from the federal courthouse in downtown Charleston. Our team has been there for all of the proceedings from the state trial, which ended in a hung jury, to this federal sentencing hearing. We were there as Walter Scott's family learned the fate of the man who shot and killed their beloved son, brother, and father. Bill Sharp joining me now. Bill, an emotional ending to a case that has sparked controversy not only here in the Low Country, but all across the nation. And today, Debbie, there was nothing like today in terms of emotion crying from both families. We'll get into that in just a minute. In the meantime, the family of Walter Scott says justice was served today by the 20 year prison sentence given out to Michael Slager by Judge David Norton. But the family says that still hasn't erased the pain of the past two and a half years since this tragic shooting occurred. Police reporter Harp Jacobs joins me now. Harp, some of the family members said in court they've had to relive the shooting over and over and over again when they see that infamous video. Yeah, Bill, that cell phone video of the shooting. In fact, Walter Scott's brother, one of his brothers said he's seen his, his, his brother killed on video thousands of times. That's exactly what he said. The Scott family says today was an historic day because a white police officer is going to prison for killing an unarmed black man. Their words. They praised Fade and Santana, who shot the cell phone video of the shooting, saying without that video, Michael Slager might still be on the police force. They also noted how the death of their loved one brought about change with a law requiring body cameras for police officers. Bill, Walter Scott's brother Rodney said, now that uh, Michael Slager is on his way to prison, it's time to move on, but he said the family will never, ever forget what happened. So move on and forgive, but never forget. Right. Police reporter Harv Jacobs. There was emotion, a lot of it, on both sides of the aisle, both families. At one point, Michael Slager himself broke down on the witness stand. Alexis Simmons has more on the emotion of the day. Alexis? Well, Michael Slager and Walter Scott's family were trying to fight back tears as they were in the courtroom sharing their statements about their loved ones. Now, Slager's wife said that her heart breaks, that she can't redo what happened, and that she asked the ju judge for mercy. Now, that's one of the first times uh, today in court we actually got to learn more about Walter Scott's interests. His family talked about how he sang in the church choir, was a family man, and loved to play board games. Now, several members also took their time to say they forgive. Michael Slager and that there was various moments when Slager wiped away his tears as you mentioned Bill. Now take a listen to what Walter Scott's brother had to say after the sentencing. But we are had held high and proud to be here today and, and, and still seeking justice for Walter and the process you know other families may not receive this but we have set a, 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 a road map for them to follow, to believe in God, and try to keep the peace. Goes out to the other families that did not receive justice. Now, Walter Scott's brother also mentioned some of the good that has come out of this case in the fact that there is a state body cam law that is going to be requiring all law enforcement officers to wear body cameras. Back to you, Bill. Alexis, thank you. We believe Michael Slager is in the Charleston County Jail tonight, awaiting his sentencing. At some point, the feds at the federal level will decide where to send him somewhere in the country in the federal penal system. In the meantime, both sides, I think, both families feel now is a time for the healing to begin. Debbie, I'll throw it back to you. Thank you, Bill, Harv, and Alexis downtown. A number of officials have made statements following the sentencing, but before the official sentencing was handed down, State Representative Wendell Gilliard said whatever the decision, both families will be negatively impacted. He went on to say, we the people are all responsible in some way because of the rise in hate and prejudice in our society. He said we need more participants and fewer critics to keep moving toward a positive change.
change. We'll continue to bring you any updates and the absolute latest moving forward. Also, legal analyst Charlie Condon will join me tonight with more on guidelines used to decide this sentence. Why haven't you learned anything? A teacher who was overheard making racial comments prior to a boys' basketball game in Forest City last week has now decided to resign. We're all foreigners. Exactly, all foreigners. <laughs> At a meeting today, the Forest City Board of Education accepted the resignation of third grade teacher Holly Jane Cusero Smith. It read in part, the comments I made were inappropriate and not a true reflection of who I am or what I believe. I had no idea a private conversation would become a public issue. That conversation could be overheard during online coverage prior to a basketball game between Forest City and Eagle Grove last Tuesday. Commentary was being provided by KIOW radio broadcaster Orrin Harris, who was heard talking to Cusero Smith about the names of certain Eagle Grove players that the two believed sounded Hispanic. Earlier this week, Harris was fired from KIOW after a more than 40-year career. Cusero Smith was also let go from the radio station and was put on administrative leave from her teaching position. We chose to have a special board meeting today. Uh, this allows for some closure to uh, this situation, allows us as a district uh, now to continue to move forward uh, and to put the focus back on the third grade classroom uh, into our elementary building and as a district. The resignation agreement states she will receive full pay through the 2017-2018 school year, as well as benefits offered through the school district in 2018. Kusaro Smith does have an early retirement package through the school. The package was approved by the school board on November 7th, 21 days before the racial conversation was had. Uh, I don't want us to lose sight that things are getting better. Uh, each successive generation... Uh, seems to be making progress in changing attitudes when it comes to race. doesn't mean we're in a post-racial society. It doesn't mean that racism is eliminated. But, you know, when I talk to Malia and Sasha, uh, and I listen to their friends, and I see them interact, uh, they're better than we are. They're better than we were on these issues. And that's true in every community uh, that I've visited all across the country. Racial tensions in Haywood High School in Brownsville, Tennessee. Racial posts on social media brought out more than 200 student protesters outside the school today. In the post, students used the N-word and made comments certain people should be hanged. Brownsville is in Haywood County, about 55 miles east of Memphis. Local 24's Tish Clark is live in Brownsville tonight, where a meeting between parents and school administrators was held this afternoon. Tish, how did that meeting go? Well, we don't know yet, Richard. Folks are still um, in the meeting now. The parking lot is packed. It's between uh, parents and some students and administrators as well. Now, we spoke with Art Garrett, the associate superintendent at Haywood County Schools. He said the district just learned about the post late yesterday morning, even though the posts were made nearly two weeks ago. We thought that they were our friends. More than 200 Haywood High School students protested outside their school demanding justice. Screenshots of racial threats posted to social media started circling Sunday. In the post, the N-word was used, and comments were made about hanging black people and white girls who date black guys. Facebook Live posts have been dominating social media. The boys, they didn't get no punishment. The district attorney's office will not file criminal charges against the boys who made the comments. The boys could face punishment at school. Associate School Superintendent Art Garrett said the district is reviewing all the findings to determine what actions will be taken. Students say they'll protest until the boys who posted the comments are punished. Racism is nothing new, okay? This is something we have to deal with in our society. It's an ugly part of our history. We don't want to be a part of our future. So we're going to stop it. Okay, and the Haywood County School District released a statement earlier today that um, safety is officials' number one concern. They had also mentioned that hatred and racism has no place in their school district. We'll have more coming up tonight at 6 o'clock. For now, we're live in Brownsville, Tennessee. Tish Clark, Local 24 News. Okay, let's just look at something I mentioned earlier, Snow White. What's the basic message of Snow White? Yeah, along with that, 
No, no, but I'm saying just the Snow White thing. Let's just stick with that one. As a message in all of these little stories, what's the basic message of Snow White? And Cinderella, another story that's somewhat similar. Yes, this is the basic message. What's, what, but what is the mechanisms of these messages when it comes to male-female relations? No, the message is you, you get pretty, and then you pretty up the house that the dwarfs have messed up because dwarfs don't know how to keep house because they work in the mines. See, Doc and Dopey and all the rest of them, see what I mean? So she comes in and she takes all the cobwebs down and all this, and she sweeps up the place. But now, since she looks at these little dwarfs, see, that's not exactly what she's got in mind, see, for a mate. So what she does is pretty herself up, and she's got something starting off with, and that is what? She's white. Melissa and Mark Stone are from the same city in Iowa, but they didn't know each other growing up. That's partly because Melissa is African American and Mark is white. Melissa says their school district was mostly white, and that helped shape her racial identity. Melissa talked to Mark about one experience in grade school that really stuck with her. I was in this performing troupe. Um, there was this one song that was really technically difficult, and it was a Disney princess song. Um, it was Someday My Prince Will Come. My mom had a friend who was a seamstress, and I think she must have gone to the fabric store and bought a pattern to make a snow white dress. And I remember the satin, and I remember the feel of the yellow and the red and the little you know, um, details on the, on the shoulder sleeve. And, um, and I remember going up to the microphone and I remember taking a deep breath, you know, getting all your jitters out. And I remember singing and, um, I did a beautiful job. I remember it went really well. Um, and there was this moment where I looked into the audience. I, I could tell they were sort of laughing to each other. You know, they were like whispering and, when I couldn't figure out what was going on, I couldn't figure out if it was someone behind me. And I remember I finally heard what one of them was saying. And they said, snow black. Hmm. That doesn't make any sense. Uh, and slowly that started to spread throughout this group. You're snow black, snow black, ha ha ha, snow black. And... I think for me, that was one of my first aha moments, um, not in understanding myself, but I think in understanding the difference between how I view myself and how I came to learn that I, the world would view me. And I remember thinking, it doesn't matter to this group that I feel beautiful in this dress and it doesn't matter to them that I'm singing really well and that I've worked really hard and that um, I am proud of what I'm doing. What mattered to them was what they could see and that it didn't make sense. And so they felt like it was okay to um, to laugh and to point and, and to to rule out those other things to consider. And that was that was pretty crushing for a seven, eight-year-old. Are you afraid about having kids? Oh, in every way, that? shape, yeah. and form. I mean, I particularly as it relates to their racial identity, I feel mm. so overprotective and I don't have them yet. But working with students in a school context, um, you know, you read the news and you feel more terrified. And you want to build them up and you want them to have a clear understanding of who they are, particularly black and brown children and students. And I wish I could envision bringing them into a better world, but it's that, what, what do we do with the one that we've got and how do we create a space where they know who they are? That was Melissa and Mark Stone. They were interviewed in Seattle by the University of Washington Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity. The interview is provided courtesy of StoryCorps, a national nonprofit whose mission is preserve and share humanity's stories in order to build connections between people and create a more just and compassionate world. www.storycorps.org. Sunday, my 
Also, allow me to apologize to other families formed through transracial adoption because I am deeply sorry that we suggested that interracial families are in any way funny or deserving of ridicule. Today, on a special snap judgment, we're going to shake it up. In collaboration with the New York Times, we pursue a family mystery, a mystery that began decades ago. 1962 in a small suburb outside of Chicago, Illinois. But we begin a generation later when Amy Sandberg was quite literally cleaning out her mother's closet. Snap judgment. Um, as we got to kind of towards the end of the closet up to the top shelves, I reached around to feel for anything to see if there's anything we had missed and I found a, a plastic bag and I pulled it down and there inside the bag was a very small white what appeared to be baptismal dress I knew right away it wasn't mine because I ha- I knew I hadn't been baptized my brothers had been baptized but I hadn't been baptized and I also could see that it wouldn't have fit me because I was 12 pounds at birth and this dress was pretty tiny I held up the dress and show, to show my aunt, who was standing there with me, and I said, do you know anything about this? Who's, whose dress is this? And she looked at it, and she goes, it's Rebecca's. Did you know who Rebecca was? So when I was a kid, nine or ten years old, one of my brothers let it slip that he had had a sister before me. So I ran into into the house and I found my mom. She was sitting at the kitchen table, and I said, "Is it true? Is it true that you had a, a, a girl before me?" I could see that she was kind of surprised that I asked the question and took her a minute to collect herself. She said, "Listen carefully, because I'm only going to tell you this story once. Your dad and I couldn't have children." and that we had adopted Stephen and Bobby, and we very much wanted a girl, so we decided to adopt a girl next. When the baby was given to us as, as an infant, she was ruddy. And I remember that word very well because I remember looking looking up the definition, definition of ruddy later because I didn't know what it meant. She decided to take the baby to our pediatrician and uh, when she brought the baby to Dr. Kamen he thought that the baby was black This is Leonard Sandberg the lawyer and a nurse came with the baby to the house to deliver the uh, baby to us it was really not a big problem for us we had two preceding kids who were adopted and everything went very smooth. And in this case, we assumed that everything would go uh, smooth until we looked at the baby. We're, we're going fine. Did you specifically ask for uh, to adopt a white baby? No, never occurred to me. Well, why why wouldn't it occur to you? Because I assumed it would be, the baby would be white. And when did you realize that she was black? Immediately, when we looked at her. What did you see? A a black baby. And did you ask about that when they dropped the baby off? Well, we were amazed and surprised. I I, I was absolutely dumbfounded. Uh, Both of us, every... uh, Marge, my wife, and I both... We're dumbfounded when we looked at the baby. Obviously, that was a big deal. Why did why did the baby being black concern you? In our situation, uh, having a, uh, uh, a, a Negro baby uh, would be uh, very difficult, uh, to say the least. Uh, we lived in a, a completely lily white area. During the time that this happened, it wouldn't have been a good idea. Can you imagine what it would have been like for this baby to have grown up in all-white Deerfield? It would have been very difficult. 
not not impossible that we would have uh, coped. She would have been the only uh, Afri- African American in the community. Uh, growing up, it might have been very difficult for her. And the boys. And and the whole family. It would it could have been a a, a mess. My mom very much wanted to keep Rebecca. That she told me that she loved her and had bonded with her and did not want to um, let her go. And my dad, um, he wanted to give Rebecca back. He wanted to give Rebecca up. My dad eventually um, won the argument, and that's when they decided to return Rebecca So what my mom told me was that social workers came to the house and they picked up Rebecca. And um, I remember my mom crying when she got to this part of the story and having difficulty finishing the story. Is it your understanding, am I getting this right, that it left a kind of a sadness or a darkness in your mom? Absolutely. Absolutely. I feel like there was all there was always this sort of hovering sadness, even though she put on a good face. It seemed like she felt like a sad person most of the time. So I've known you for 55 years, and um, the first word to describe you wouldn't be sentimental. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, did you experience any heartbreak over the baby being taken away? It was definitely moving, and I felt really, really bad. We then made uh, arrangements or, or set out right away to uh, get another baby, <laughs> which was you. <laughs> <laughs> I know this is speculative, but if it had been today, do you think you would have been okay with adopting a black baby? Of course. No question whatsoever. I have no, no no qualm about it. What's changed? Oh, the times have changed. Um, <clears throat> can you tell me what Deerfield was like at this time? It was small. When I was a little girl, there was maybe 12,000 residents. It was an all-white community, and it was very racially tense. There had been this housing controversy... A few years before baby Rebecca came to the Sandbergs, the town had been rocked by a pretty ugly racial controversy. A developer had made plans to build an integrated housing complex, and the majority of townspeople rallied against it and got it shut down. There was a jeering town meeting. The whole thing made national headlines. There were a few people in Deerfield who stood up in favor of the integrated housing, including Amy's parents and a local pastor. They very much saw themselves as progressives. And these people were harassed. A cross was burned on someone's lawn. The pastor, Paul Berggren, was so upset about the town's racist response that he actually made an announcement. He said he was going to adopt a black baby. And it did not go over well. This is his daughter, Deborah. She was a student at Deerfield High at the time. I actually am looking right now at um, an article from 1960, and it says, White pastor in Deerfield asked to adopt Negro child. And I remember specifically that I came into the lunchroom, and as I went to sit down, these other girls said that I couldn't sit there because my dad was a commie and uh, an end lover. Another article that I've come across has the headline, warned on adopting Negro, minister threatened. They got a bomb threat. I know my mother then became skittish about really pursuing this adoption of a, of a black child because what it could mean for the entire family and it was, it was it best for that adoptive child. So I think my mother was the one that finally just said, we need to let this go. You had brothers who were little boys when the baby was brought home, right? Right. So they would have been about, Bobby would have been five at the time, and Steve would have been eight at the time. Rebecca was brought home. Uh, my name is Steven Sandberg, 
And uh, I'm about to tell a story about a sister I had that I don't, don't have anymore. Her name was Becky. And, um, and I don't know too much about what's happened to her over the years. But what I know about her was was wonderful, but very short-lived. I could I can remember my dad sitting in a chair, TV chair, and I could still remember my dad getting in that chair and holding on to Becky and curled up in the chair and falling asleep in front of the TV with her. I remember my parents every night kept the windows and the, the blinds shut most of the time. It's like my parents didn't want anybody to know we were home. And we, I mean, I, I, I knew that there was trouble in the town, but I didn't understand then how it related to my sister and our family. And I just, to this day, it, it just feels like it, it just wasn't right. It wasn't normal. It shouldn't have happened. And they took my sister. It was wrong. It was all of a sudden one day, several people showed up and uh, my mom had her wrapped in blankets and everything else and, and wouldn't let, would let her go. They basically pry her out of my mom's hands. And they just didn't hardly say anything. They just walked out. And I didn't understand at all what was going on. And my mom just told me that Becky's gone and she's not going to come back. And that was it. It was very, very cold. After after they left, I sat on the step outside. It seemed like for hours with my mom. I'm sorry, holding her hand because she was so upset. And all she would say is they took my baby. They took my baby. That's all she would say. I kept saying, I'm sorry, Mom. I didn't know what to do. Your dad seems to say it was his choice to return Rebecca, but Steve is talking as though some outside force came and took Rebecca. I think that Steve's eight-year-old mind couldn't understand what the adults were thinking. I think he, he saw his baby sister being forcibly taken out of my mom's hands and people leaving with her. When we lost Rebecca, it changed my parents. My parents traveled all over the world and were very close and loved each other very much. And when we lost Becky, I believe that it ultimately led to their divorce. We, we had conversations um, even before, just before, shortly before she died. Um, and she still, on her deathbed, couldn't believe that something like that happened to her because she was such a strong believer in treating everybody the same in equality that, that she was, it was almost like 50 years of shock that this could happen to her and actually did happen to her. And it still affected her 50 years later. Dad and I have talked about it, and he he seems to think that she was only there two or three weeks or a much shorter period of time than I do. And I can tell you that that I I just don't think Dad remembers what happened. But I just remember it was cold and it was spring when we got Rebecca, and I remember it was the middle of summer. It started getting very hot. I truly believe that she was with us about three months, and I know it was very shortly after that, that, uh, that we got my sister, Amy. Let's touch on this. When I first told you that I was going to search for Rebecca, can you describe your reaction to that news? I, f- I felt that it was, uh, digging up the, uh, an un- unpleasant, uh, part of my past that I really had completely forgotten about and didn't really want to uh, re- relive. What changed your mind? You. You wanted to go forward with it. It was okay. But was it okay with him? Not initially. What did he do? How did he react? 
he just shut it down. He didn't want to talk about it. He says, I don't want you to do that. That's foolish. And he said to me, "If I just want you to know that if you decide to go ahead with this, there will be consequences, and I will not have anything to do with you. Whoa. Yeah. And my brothers then stopped talking to me as well. So why did you, I mean, did you think about not doing it? Never. Why did you want to do it? I feel like at that point I was pretty obsessed with finding out if she was okay. Like, I wanted to do it for my mom, mostly. About the same time I found the baptismal dress while I was going through my mom's things, I also found a bunch of her diaries. She had written, my mom had written about thinking of Rebecca praying for her for her having had a good life and a good outcomes and a loving family and you know it's just something that she walked around with it was a burden that she carried and and this diary this diary entry was from 1993 and she was still thinking about Rebecca you know 31 years later and I wanted to answer that question like I wanted to know that she was okay Amy had three clues when she began her search. A tiny picture of baby Rebecca, and a rough idea of the year and the time of year that Rebecca was born. Well, a couple, of people, a couple of people said that it was not long after. My husband and I went to the Cook County Law Library in downtown Chicago. Okay, so yeah, it might be 19, so it could possibly conceivably be 62, and I would definitely go there before I'd go 58. But it's likely it could be May if she was adopted in April. We went into this little room where they had several microfiche machines looking for a petition to adopt. May of 62? How long did you guys spend in that library? We spent seven hours in the library. And at 4.30, a half an hour before the library closed. Holy moly. Wow. And we were almost out of here. Jeez. And, and, and we both saw it, like, at the same time. Crazy. That's funny that you just came over here. My heart's beating so rapidly right now. <laughs> Holy moly. Whoa. My heart's beating so rapidly right now. <laughs> so we don't know if that was... So we don't know if that was her father's name or her mother's name, though. This petition right here, yeah. that's the petition number. Yeah, right. Now we have to figure out, can we, get a, can we get our hands on the petition? Right. As she gathered information, Amy worked with a woman she called the Adoption Whisperer, a kind of expert detective on all things adoption, Militia Mitchell. Together they narrowed down names and dates in Militia's living room. Smith. Angel, A-N-G-E-L-L-E, it looks like. I had a client named Angel Smith. Really Smith. We then had five names to five, five or six names to work with, and we started to Google each of those names and just trying to look for some online footprint of each of those people. So when I left the hospital two days later, <laughs> I found a blog post. Smith has their angel. This is posted by Angel in parentheses, angel, like the heavenly angel, Kimberly Smith. Huh? I've been angel all my life. I think there's no doubt we have the right person here. Though. In a very crazy coincidence, Militia, this adoption whisperer, realized she knew Angel Smith, the woman they had found. So normally it would be against protocol to just call this found adoptee out of the blue. But since Militia knew her, they picked up the phone. Hello? Yeah, I'm looking for Angel Smith. Uh, I don't know if you remember me or if you're the Angel Smith I remember working with. I'm looking so my, my biggest fear was that I would, well, my biggest fear was that I wouldn't find Rebecca, that I would search and not find her. Angel, uh, I just want to I'm great, but you just are not going to believe why I'm calling. 
closely behind that, my, my second biggest fear was that I would find her, but she wouldn't want to be found and that she would be upset with the news that I was delivering. She was, okay. I know you are. So let me start again. There was a baby whose name was Monica Gordon. And she was placed with a family in Chicago, Mr. and Mrs. Sandberg. A white family. Correct. Did you ever know about this? Are you freaking out? No. Yeah, yeah. I was pacing like okay. a like a caged cat while Militia was talking to her. I'm going to pass you now to Amy Roost. Yeah, I'm going to let her take over the phone now, okay? Hi, Angel. Hi, Amy. How are you? Bless you, bless you, bless you. <laughs> I'm shaking a little bit right now. How about you? Girl, you know I am. I mean, I'm so excited right now. And I was in the 99 cent store waiting for my husband to come out of the doctor's office. And he's just browsing up and down the line. I left my whole basket, ran out of the store, and I'm now sitting in my car. <laughs> oh, wow. Well... We're positive. So, Angel, let let me tell you a little bit of the story and um, fill in some some of the, the information that Melissa. When you first got on the phone with her, like, what did you tell her at first? Were you trying to like e- ease into it? I did ease into it. So my <laughs> so my parents adopted you, and they were told that your parents were both white. And you were very light skinned and they didn't know until a couple of weeks later when you continued to get darker, they took you to a pediatrician and the pediatrician thought you might be biracial. And this is where the story, well, this is where, this is where the story gets a little dicey, but I want, before I tell you the rest of the story, what I want to tell you first is that in Deerfield in 1962, there was extreme racism. There was extreme racial tensions. God, all over the world, it was extreme racism. Still is. Yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. But, but let, it, me in, explain, let me just give you a hint so you don't have to worry. Okay. Uh, but, I was chosen by and for It was immediately clear that Angel had been adopted by a wonderful family. My parents, um, my mother very, very much wanted to keep you. My dad felt that it would be unfair to his sons, my brothers, and um, to you, to you, to raise you in an all-white community in 1962. And Angel was shockingly receptive to this news about herself. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, so I was, you know, naturally I was very, I was very worried. Ah, oh, you're my sister, exactly. At some point, yeah, she said, yeah. you know, my head is just reeling, and I need to get off the phone. Can we talk later? Then, And then we eventually made a plan to meet. Did you tell your dad? So I called my dad, and he and I left a message on his, his voicemail saying, you know, Angel's coming to town, and she would love to meet you. Um, I hope that you'll be able to meet with us. Maybe we could have brunch together on Sunday. And a couple days went by, and then on Saturday he called, and he said, okay, let's meet for brunch. I felt a mixture of tension and relief. And my dad's 89, and he's very fit, but he was looking very small. (laughs) She went up to him and tapped him on the shoulder and held out her arms and gave him a, just a giant hug. We were seated at our table. We ordered a round of mimosas, and she began telling us about her life. I have a blood on I've heard this. Right out of the hospital. Yeah, exactly. And so I heard the story. I knew that I was biracial and that... Um, that my family, they had expected me to be white, but I didn't know that they were talking you about You talked about how at the beginning of your search, you were, family, were wanting to see if she was okay. So this is that, uh, do you feel like so you were, like, trying to show your dad, look, she's okay? 
But she turned her life turned out okay. I mean, I did. I will say this: I did feel some responsibility for the meeting going well. I did. I remember taking some pride in little parts of her stories that I wanted to make sure she shared with my dad. I was in private school, and she had two. We had a summer home in Union Pier, Michigan, and a home in Chicago. So she had two mortgages. Angel hit the family lottery. After leaving the Sandbergs, she was adopted by Ruth and Harry Smith, a black couple. They lived in a middle-class black neighborhood. They owned a stationery store. They had a large network of loving friends and family. And she shared with us about her childhood, how she had uh, been very close to her parents and grown up in this wonderful community where, you know, she was thought of it as, you know, a village. And then, when she was eight, her dad suddenly died. She left her small private school. She and her mom moved to Los Angeles. They no longer had their village of supportive friends. And then the the, the story um, took this very distressing turn because she began to explain how when she got to Los Angeles, she got inter- introduced to cocaine. And I can't honestly say that I was running from anything or hiding from anything. I just liked the way cocaine tasted. Really liked it and started doing more cocaine and, and eventually ended up... Um, becoming homeless and and living on the streets. So the conversation came back around to the decision to return Rebecca. Which is how all of this happened. And I'm so grateful. I can't even imagine growing up in Deerfield, the only black Yeah, I mean, can can you just imagine what her life would have been like? I mean, you imagine it because, like, one one. I mean, the only black child, child in the white community. community. And look at this hair. The persecution. No. It would have been, been a problem in this. Yeah. Probably. I, I, Not probably. Definitely. Absolutely. I was very, always have been very grateful for whoever you were. Now that I know who you are, is wonderful. <laughs> you know, I always wanted to be able to say thank you. You know, it's because, <laughs> you know, you never know how people are going to perceive things. No. And I just wanted you to know that, you know, my parents were ever grateful. I am so grateful. Huh. And it passes on to Amy. I just love yeah. her, the fact that she had the kind of heart to find me, you know, to look for me. is just, you know, uh, I, I it speaks volumes. I'm sure. There's something about this tape that's uncomfortable of this brunch. Mm-hmm. Can, can you name it? Well, listening to the tape, you know, like I didn't feel that at, I didn't feel what I'm about to tell you at the brunch, but listening to the tape, the part that made me feel uncomfortable was, I think we were all trying to rationalize what happened. My parents' decision that it was for the best and it may have very well have been for the best. And I know Angel believes it was for the best, but I felt like there was an attempt to gloss over and make everybody sort of assuage everybody's guilt about what had taken place. There's so much reassuring going on. Exactly. When you, Angel, when you were going, when you knew you were going to meet Len Sandberg, for that first time, did you have any hopes or any fears? Oh, girl, no, I don't live on fear. I I was so excited to be able to thank him and to what I thought would probably free him um, from any type of ignorance, shall I say. When, when I say ignorance, I mean him not knowing me not knowing how I would respond, how I had, you know, ingested the whole, the whole incident, the whole experience, who I had become, you know what I'm saying? I could dispel all of those notions. He would finally get to see, this is me. This is who I am. I'm really grateful. From the bottom of my heart, I am so grateful. And are you okay with that? I like, like that being on you to validate that for him? Did you feel like you had a responsibility to make him comfortable, to to reassure him that you're okay? No, no, that wasn't my responsibility, but I knew that it would happen. You know, it it comes with a certain level of, 
excuse me, did I make the right choice? Yeah, and especially, you know, when when you're checking your moral compass. You know what I'm saying? Because it was about race. You know, we can't pretend that it wasn't. It was about race. And what does that say about me as a human being? I can attest to, hey, it was all good. It was okay. You made the right choice, dude, and I'm the only one who could have validated that for him. You know, like I explained to him, I said, hey, look, it's like this. If I were to order a dress on the Internet and then they send me instead of sending me a red dress because I have this gorgeous red bag and shoes and they send me a little black dress, cute little black dress, but it doesn't go with my ensemble. (laughs) So it's got to go back. It's got to go back. (laughs) And and when I, I shared that with him, he was like, what? And I said, I mean, that is a crazy thing. To, that's a little I'm like, what too, Angel? Like, it's a little bit of a crazy thing to say. You were human. Come on. Come on. Come on. And I'm still human, you know, and I am still human. And I, I do have a brain. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> come on. Seriously. You have a white family in a white community. Didn't nobody order a little black child to throw into this mix? Did, did you ever for a moment not have that? that like positive perspective on it was was it ever was learning this part of your story ever i don't know hard to swallow or did it make you feel any kind of way never 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 you know i i was i was adopted or chosen twice before i was one month old you know i could be one oh poor me nobody wanted me no it took the right people to deal with me <laughs> you know Black Black babies babies cost less. dear brothers sisters comrades friends on the move as we meet today we are living examples of a truly remarkable movement a movement for life for liberation for resistance and yes for love. We have fought for these things for years. And yes, we fight for it today. But let me tell you something. Your love for your brother, me, has kept me safe and sane through almost 30 years on death row. Know this. Throughout it all, I have never felt alone. To the eye, I was alone in solitary confinement on death row, but the eye cannot really see all that is, for behind brick and steel I felt your love, sometimes like a wave, sometimes like a whisper, but always there, ever present. And even when you, the people, our people, pulled me off of death row, I felt you still in the air like a fragrance from a flower, the scent of. And when I fell into a coma, literally, when I was unconscious, you were there, literally, just a few feet away, pulling me back into consciousness and back into life, into health, and into strength. I hope you feel my love and gratitude for all that you have done in all that we will do. Love begets love. And as we march on, this movement gets stronger and stronger every day. Thank you, all of you, for being there. We are on the move. I love you all. This is your brother, Mumia Abu Jamal. Context of white supremacy. Gus T. Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Saturday, December 9th, 2017. So I have been told this is our weekly compensatory call in. Dial in if you have observations counter racist suggestions thoughts on any of the segments that we heard previously the number six four one seven one five three six four zero the code five six four nine four three 
pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. Number again, six four one seven one five three six four zero. The code five six four nine four three pound. Press star six one if you would like to participate. A few things before we get to the callers. First of all, we are listener supported counter racist radio invest. If you think the program is constructive, uh, you can visit my blog racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com racism hyphen notes dot blogspot dot com. Uh, when you hit the blog, my PayPal is in the top right corner. You should see the PayPal button. If you're not into PayPal, drop us an email. We will get you a physical mailing address. Huge thanks to all the folks who have invested uh, nearly a decade of broadcasting. Uh, you can also support us uh, by visiting my wish list at Amazon.com. It is under Gus T. Renegade. Uh, it's also linked on my blog. I also posted it on my Facebook page, uh, Twitter as well. Thanks again for everyone who has been generous, gracious enough to support the program. I hope the cows has been continues to be worthy of your time and energy. And I hope the program has helped non-white people, particularly black people, get an accurate understanding of what it means to be white, what racism, white supremacy is and how it works. That said, uh, quick comments to get to. The iTunes feed had not been updating at all of late uh, for some reason beyond my control. Could be racist interference. Uh, it was said that this was a site wide problem that many folks, if not everyone, uh, was having some sort of interference with uploading content. It seems that's been corrected. Uh, the iTunes feed should be current as of yesterday's broadcast the wisdom of psychopaths uh that should be in the itunes feed i checked earlier today uh and this podcast if everything is working correctly will be uploaded uh within a few minutes after it's done uh there does still seem to be a problem with some of the older uh archives not loading correctly uh, i'm going through individually just to check to make sure that they are working uh at this point that is a lot of content, so it will take a while to go through to double check to see, you know, that they are working. You can stream them, download them. Uh, our content is also available at Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, also, the current content is being posted at SoundCloud. We also have content. Uh, Mr. Fox, one of our listeners, investors in the UK, has posted lots of our content, uh, if not most of it, uh, on YouTube. It's available in a wide array of places uh, online, uh, just lots and lots of content over the years, nearly a decade of broadcasting. But that's one. Uh, also, there has been reports. There have been reports that some people have had uh, problems dialing in that uh, they were being charged a fee to dial in uh, to the program. That also strikes me as Suspicious could be racist interference, uh, but you can also use if you are not able to dial in via your phone and you want to uh, listen. If you're on, you know, you have your smartphone mobile device, you can use the free HD app that is available. If you go to you can use the address tiny T I N Y dot C C forward slash one race. And that is the number one. If you use that address, you can use that to access the VOP line. That's another way that you can call into the program. Uh, if you have a uh, tablet, computer, whatever it is, uh, you can use the VOP line. But you also, if you have a cell phone, you'll see the app, the free HD app on that page. You can download that and it's very easy to use. Lots of our listeners have used it. Some folks may be using it now. It's free. And it's basically the same principle. When you download the app, you just put in the number 641-715-3640 and the code 564-943-POUND. Uh, if you do that, you can access the program, you can participate, or you can just listen if you just want to stream the content. But you can also use the free HD app 
for free if you are being charged a fee for dialing in to listen to the cows. Racist man, racist woman, racist child, usual suspects. We should be back on Monday. We just did the broadcast a few days ago uh, talking about uh, black maternal mortality rates and resources for expecting black parents. Uh, We will be addressing the same subject matter again uh, this coming Monday. Uh, Black Mamas on Bed Rest. You can visit the website uh, to see some of the great work that we will be talking about. Important subject. And also because I know some of our listeners reported that they think uh, the statistics about black maternal mortality rates, they think that's bogus. I think just two days after our broadcast this past Tuesday, NPR did a significant, like a seven minute segment uh, on that very subject matter. Uh, I posted it on my Facebook page. You can check it out. I might use it as the introduction for uh, this coming Monday's program. Uh, But they said they think that's bogus. They do not think that black females are experiencing any difficulties or high mortality rates as a result of pregnancy. They think that that's uh, just racist lies. Uh, I asked for specific details and didn't seem like, seemed like there could have been more. But uh, if you have an opinion, uh, certainly this coming Monday, I will make sure to ask that question uh, and get a response. Uh, Next, the folks down in California. I know over the years we've had a lot of listener support in the California area. I used to be a California resident myself. Uh, I hope no one is being impacted by the fires. I hope everyone is safe uh, and not having to evacuate or worry about life, major property. I hope everyone uh, in the state of California, all of the non-white people, especially black people, are safe. That said, when I heard that Simi Valley had to evacuate because of the fires, ooh-wee, I don't know if that was about justice, but wow, I had to contain a smile on my face when I just thought of some of the remarks that I heard. Anyway, not to dwell on that. Uh, The segment on, speaking of California, the segment on Bennett Omalu, folks should remember him from Concussion. Remember the uh, film from 2015, Will Smith played Mr. Uh, Bennett Omalu uh, about all of the injuries, CTE as they now call it, <clears throat> impacting football players, most of them black, uh, with this affliction, uh, brain damage in a very literal sense. And he had a report of racism, white supremacy. He's had reports of being a victim of racism all throughout his career, even with all his academic training and everything else. Even the fact that he was not born in the U.S. does not seem to have saved him from white supremacy racism. He had a huge write up right after that movie came out where he said that he had been trying to share this information for years and he felt that he had been ignored and or people just took his work without crediting him for it as a result of racism. He said he felt like that's that's what he's been experiencing for years. Then with this, he says that the suspected race soldier sheriff is mutilating body parts, cutting off hands, encouraging him and other colleagues, encouraging he and other colleagues to fabricate autopsy reports when there is suspicion of police homicide, meaning an officer has killed someone, maybe unjustly. Fabricate the report so it doesn't, I think he was saying, change it to a uh, cause of death unknown. Wow. And this was so bad that he had to resign. And in fact, uh, a white woman resigned from the same office and corroborated what he was saying. In the state of California, incredible medical apartheid. That was one of the first things I thought of Uh, the segment on adoption. Wow. Wow. I was reading in the paper and that's how I found out about uh, Bennett Omalu. I read that in the paper and then I went to see if I could find audio to, to share on the broadcast. While I was checking out the news, there was also 
the report or a report about uh, this black female, Miss Smith, who was adopted and then sent back. Uh, and they said, oh, yeah, you can hear, you know, the report on this. So I said, I will I will check this out. Wow. Uh, black self-respect. Dr. Welsing talked about the significance of black self-respect. I cannot emphasize that enough for that particular segment. I am very curious to hear your thoughts about what you heard. I omitted a portion of the segment where they talked about Mrs. Smith's typical Negro pathologies uh, where they had to make sure to emphasize or not emphasize, but they had to make sure that it was included that ultimately uh, Miss Smith's adoption when she was with a black family, uh, the black father, adopted black father died at a pretty young age. Uh, and that obviously made it tough financially on the family. Uh, eventually, uh, Miss Smith was homeless uh, she was addicted to cocaine. She talks about how she loved the taste of cocaine. She became uh, HIV positive, like all of the typical Negro pathologies, right? So they include that in the segment, of course. Uh, and so then that they include that and then they end on, you know, the the metaphor, <laughs> the black dress has to go back. I am not saying that it would have been a wonderful thing for this white family to adopt a black child. Not a correct thing. Not at all. I have spoken explicitly, consistently, harshly about white abduction of black children. That said, wow, like <laughs> the reassurance, <laughs> the reassurance that Wait a minute, even with that logic, these white people were still practicing racism. That's not even being acknowledged. All of these excuses and justifying and minimizing and the metaphor, the black dress has to go back. On this broadcast explicitly, the compensatory program, uh, compensatory call in, I request if we could not use metaphors. I've often found a lot of times racism, white supremacy is in the metaphors that we use easily, often, not even thinking about racism, white supremacy is there even at a subconscious level. That metaphor, it was pretty explicit. But a lot of times the metaphors, I think that's why Mr. Fuller uh, recommends not using the phrase cream of the crop. Subject, suggesting white is on top, white supremacy, white domination. Even the metaphors often are transporting racism, white supremacy concepts. Also, racists, they use these metaphors to be very deceptive. Uh, often they will contrast, compare two items, concepts that are not equivalent at all. They do this frequently. It is a master act of deception racism, non-white people, black people, we have been exposed to this behavior for a long time. And many of us, Gus T included, we are still learning. We have not come to conclusions on particular topics. That's totally fine. But sometimes we will use a metaphor in place of logic to explain a concept. And often that just adds to confusion. If we could be explicit direct about what it is we want to say that would be appreciated i will prompt about the metaphors uh, if folks could take about five minutes to share your commentary that would be great just make sure everyone gets at least one chance to share i'm sure we will have ample time uh, if you have additional comments questions you would like to add uh, also if you are in a noisy environment if you could use your mute button that would be super appreciated uh, if you know other people are talking or they have the television on or if just if it's a lot of background noise, uh, you can, you know, make your commentary and then just mute your line. That way it preserves the quality of the broadcast. Thank you kindly. With that, first few folks who dialed in, line should be open. Proceed. Hello, can I be heard? Evening, Puff. Hello. 
How's it going? Uh, two things I want to talk about. Um, the the African American Museum just opened today in Jackson, and uh, you know, I just want to call out just one of the patterns in that adoption and in the uh, African American Museum. I want to call out uh, the white pattern. The white pattern seems to be let's re-traumatize the victim. Uh, with with that, you know, I haven't been down there. I don't know where it's going to open or whatever or wherever. Our mayor got on TV. I live in Jackson, Mississippi. And our mayor got on TV and said that he's not going to, you know, participate because the governor had Trump come to the opening of the uh, African Museum there. And so um, he didn't feel the need to participate in it. And then Trump came and all of that stuff. So I just, I kind of stayed away from it. But when she talked about, you know, in the clips before uh, you came on, they were talking about uh, the museum and... uh, it just it's it's re traumatizing. In other words, you you're standing under a tree and it's dark. I mean that whole thing just kinda it's it's the re traumatization of the of the of the victim there. You know, and then she's talking about lynching and all that and I just and then I thought about, you know, the without sanctuary, uh before that, with our sanctuary, came here to uh, Jackson, Mississippi. Their exhibit came to, I think it came to Jackson State a few years ago. Uh, that was, I mean, you know, it just shows just pictures of lynching victims and that type of thing. And, and I thought about, that's where I first thought about the concept of, you know, just re-traumatization of the victim. And speaking of re-traumatization, that adoption, they did her a they did her the biggest favor by not, you know, letting her be subjected to, you know, the whites in the sixties. To being adopted into a white family, it's not I just I just don't see how, you know, whites have not only the carte blanche to just adopt any race of child, not just, you know, not just blacks, but Haitians and African children. They just seem to have carte blanche and can adopt any race of child, you know, from Hispanic to just any child. But but speaking of her, you know, the the adoption, uh the the whole adoption thing, they tried to re traumatize her. In other words, to tell her that, that uh to meet with us and let us tell you that you were not wanted and all this old type of stuff. But she she ex- she did exercise self respect as a victim and she was not allowed to be traumatized. In other words, well the the interviewer keep adding to they they she tried to add to the traumatization. Also, she tried to, oh, didn't you feel neglected and didn't you feel? She says no. And that was, I thought that was, I thought that was great. I'm sorry that I didn't read that she was HIV positive and that, but I'm sorry about that. But it just, she had a hard life. I, I really hate it for her, but uh, for this, she triumphed on, on that, on that end. But uh, the other thing I wanted to I wanted to say was you know about um, the metaphors that metal. I mean, Gus, in the times you've been doing this program, never have you been more right, and this crystallized like the the what metaphors mean and and that type of thing and and. I, I wouldn't have never thought of that. I mean, the, the metaphor, that metaphor was 
I'm glad that she didn't allow the the white people and the interviewer to re-traumatize her for the re-traumatization work. Who who is me and and have her crying and have her little you know interviewer tactic or whatever to to uh, produce the uh, result that they wanted. You know, with the with the traumatization, but I'm glad it didn't work on them and it backfired pretty much. And but Gus, never have you been more right and crystallized just today. You know the meaning of metaphors and and how they don't go together at all. She tried to compare herself to a dress, like you can just a baby is not something that you can. I wouldn't even compare those two things at all, and that's all I want to say. Go ahead with the next person. Appreciate that puff. Metaphors, very important uh, to pay close attention. Uh, other folks who dialed in with a hand up, line should be open. Hello? Yes, uh, your volume is a little low. We can hear you, though. Okay, I'll try to. Is this better? Uh, that's better. If you could use lots of black self-respect, try to give us as much volume as you can, maybe even uh, speak closer to the mic. That might help, too. Oh, okay. Is this better? That is an improvement. Oh, okay. I I I joined in a little late, uh, so I'm sorry. I didn't hear all the clips. Did you, did you have a clip on the honoring of the of Major Robert Lawrence, the first black astronaut? No, ma'am. Okay. Well, uh, the Kennedy Space Center just honored him on, on December 8th on Friday. And I, I'm sure you're aware that he's the brother in law. Uh, he was the brother in law of uh, Dr. Welsing. Um, he died in an accident. But I just wanted to let everyone know that he was indeed honored as the first black astronaut. Grand, I'm posting that. I remember Dr. Welsing's sister. Uh, she spoke with us, uh, Lauren Crest Love. She spoke with us a couple times last year, and she talked about uh, her brother-in-law, uh, Robert Lawrence, and her suspicions that he may have been subject to foul play. Uh, that there may have been foul play with his uh, death. He was training uh, another white astronaut who I think she was saying he wasn't even qualified uh, to be in the program at the time, and a lot of the death threats uh, that the family got, the Welsing family got uh, when he died. And I mean, same time period in the 1960s and, you know, niggers aren't supposed to be in the space program and all that. I think she said that her sister, uh, Barbara Cress Lawrence, that she saved the letters that she used to get uh, from, you know, people calling her terrorizing her husband even after he died. But I'll post that. Yeah. I will even contact Lauren Crest Love to see if she paid attention to the festivities to see what she had to say about all this. Oh, wonderful. Well, I also wanted to offer my pos posthumous uh, congratulations to him. So thank you. For sure. Appreciate that. Uh, other folks who dialed in, if you have a hand up, line should be open. Proceed. Hello, Gus. Um, may I be heard? Yes, ma'am. I've uh, actually called into the show before for workplace racism, and I sent you an email. I am someone that works in clinical research. So I'm just calling in with an observation. Um, I've been doing site selection visits and site initiation visits where we start sites on clinical research um, for whatever protocol we're using. And one trend that I have noticed is that a lot of physicians, because of um, what they're not getting paid for for medical care from insurance companies, they are signing up to conduct research with very little clinical trial experience. And they're offering clinical trials to their patients for various illnesses. So this is something that people should be aware of in terms of when you go to your physician and 
you have, you know, maybe something a little bit more complex wrong with you, that your physician may be involved in a clinical research study for that exact syndrome or disease. And rather than just one-on-one treatment, they'll offer to put you in a research study and they may not have a great deal of experience in the ex- in how to execute that study. So that is something that black people need to be aware of because a lot of the clinics and things I've been to are private practices rather than hospital groups or groups associated with academia. So that's what I was calling to say. Hmm. Would the would the recommendation be because I guess of late they have, there's been a big push to say well one of the problems is we don't have black people participating in these research studies uh, because of suspicions and the Tuskegee experiment racism white supremacy black people are leery so we need to get black people to participate in the research studies so would your recommendation be to not participate or to try to get as much information as possible to make an informed decision what would your suggestion be? Well, there's always an informed consent form that people have to fill out. But, yes, that is a big thing, that black people are not participating in research studies. Um, The biggest research, the research studies that they're seeking more black participants on are, like, phase two studies. And those are, uh, phase one is the first time they use it in humans. Phase two is when they're trying to figure out the dosage. So between phase one and phase two, those are the studies that they want more black people in because they want that racial statistical data to figure out whether or not for this ethnic group does it work. Most physicians' offices are involved in phase three where they're trying to figure out the efficacy, and that's where they want more black people involved in. I would say, depending on what the issue is, I wouldn't necessarily sign my name to an informed consent because there's the possibility that you will not be placed on the active study drug. So most double-blind studies, the decision of who gets randomized into the placebo, which is the fake drug versus the actual drug is made by the medical monitor, but that person has access to your demographic information. So they know whether or not you're white or black. That's where, you know, the the big consideration that you have to take. Now, if you have something like cancer and this is your last Um, chance at maybe a cure or progression free survival, you may want to take that risk, but just know that it's not the physician that's treating you that is making the decision of what arm of the study you're in, whether or not you're receiving the active drug or the fake drug. That's great information. Uh, Definitely something to think about if we have other folks. I know we have other listeners who are in the medical field. If you've seen a similar pattern uh, with regards to these research studies where black people are being placed in the groups, I guess especially what you're talking about, where black people are being placed in the placebo group where they're not even getting whatever the experimental drug is. Uh, If other folks have seen that pattern, if we have other people in research, uh, feel free to chime in. That is... uh, Great one to think about for listeners. Just to tell you, for most of the studies that black people are involved in, Mm -hmm. from my experience, are observational studies where you have to sign up to receive a procedure or get some type of advice. And I wrote this to you in the email a while ago. So basically it's like you're picking your own poison and you're only consenting to allow them to watch what happens to you very similar to how they did the Tuskegee experiment um, but more up to date in terms of it's all legal now 
those are the studies that you find most black people in. I see. I see. Excellent information. Thank you so much for, for sharing that with listeners. If we have other folks in the medical field, uh, feel free. Uh, if you've you know seen a similar pattern or if you have questions. Uh, other listeners, uh, if you dial in, if you have a hand up, if you have commentary you want to share, line should be open. Proceed. Excuse me, can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, greetings to you, Dennis, and um, to the other calls and listeners. Um, wow, great, great clips this evening. Um, the black female who spoke after Puff and Hi Puff, um, it's good to hear you too. It's been a while. Um, she had actually brought up exactly what I was going to bring up, which was um, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Um, I sent you the article on that around like 1051 last night or something like that. Because when I saw it, I immediately thought of Dr. Welsing and um and and her sister uh, Lauren Crest Love and um and Barbara Crest Lawrence. Um, so I sent it to you, and I figured you probably didn't see it. So I'm glad she brought it up. Um, I actually was going to read a, a brief article. It's actually the one I sent to you. I was going to read it, but um I'll get into the clips. But I just wanted to pay my respects to him as well, and you know it just goes to show you just how hard it is to be a black person, a black pioneer, um, scientific pioneer in a system of white supremacy. It takes 50 years to the day of your death. You know, December 8th was when he had the, the plane crash. I would say he was probably assassinated by, I think it was that German, that other German uh, pilot. Um, ultimately, you know, 50 years later for you to be recognized for what you are, which is just a brilliant black scientist and all of, you know, terrorism his family had to go through. It was just horrible. So it's just great to know that he's um he's getting getting the recognition he deserves. It's just shameful and disgusting and and white racist and terroristic that it would take that long. Um, the the clip that you had played with the I think it was a a, a black female that was in a tragic arrangement, and they had the whole story of the. Uh, of Snow White. I just thought that that was just really uh, hard to listen to um, when they called her uh, Snow Black and, and were just teasing her. I couldn't imagine. I try to put my myself, my, my head in her space just to kind of be able to empathize. And I was just like, wow, that is horrible. Because I remember just, you know, you, when you're young, you, you, you're much more confused. So you'll do things that like today I could look back and say, man, you know, I had serious mental problems as a child, you know, running around with a Superman mask of a white man's face and I'm a child, but you know, I, I don't know any better, but like thinking about it, 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 you know, white people could have responded to me no different. You know, she just happened to be the person receiving it. So I put myself in her headspace and it was just hard to listen to. And it just really shows, um, I remember it was uh, Dr. Aishaka Musa Barashango. He has a book, um, African People, European Holidays, A Cultural Genocide. And man, I think that that story shows the, the genocidal nature of adopting white cultural norms and things that don't belong to us that were created by our enemies. Um, because it's, it's, we just set ourselves up for really horrific racist experiences that can be life-altering sometimes. And to me, that was one that I think for anyone put in a position like that, a black child, that could be life altering potentially. Um, so I, it just was uh, something that was quite hard to listen to. Um, the the story about the white adopt abduction of the black child, um, they called her Rebecca, but her name was her name Angelique, uh, Gus? I think they changed her name after... She the original adoption was rescinded. Uh, I guess they were calling okay. her Rebecca when she was with the White family, and then it was uh, Angel when she got oh, readopted. Angel, okay, okay, thank you, it's Angel. Okay, so um, Angel, yes, um, it was interesting. I was listening to the White female talking about her mom and the fact that her life was never the same. And all I thought about was she wanted to abuse a black child that bad, you know, <laughs> that 
it was something that she was dwelling on 30 years later and writing journals about. And I thought about, you know, the fact that they couldn't have children again, white genetic annihilation, nature getting rid of them. And, uh, the fact that what would be more normal than to have a melanated child, because that's the norm. So it's, it, 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 I'm thinking of the psychology of white supremacy and how it works in the family dynamic right theirs, and um, the psychological uh, vampirism on a newborn uh, black life. You could just see it right there. Um, he, the husband, he said that not not have black female baby was a most unpleasant part of his life at one point in the story. So again, not having ownership over the black child that you can abuse at will and having them in this terroristic environment was something that has haunted these people. Or I, ah, metaphor, let's get rid of that, that, that these people have carried and um, chose to, to, to speak on in ways to make it seem like it was something that they were, they had some sort of feeling for this child that was positive when the entire situation was just horrific. And I thought that Angel exhibited extreme black self-respect when she just made it clear, like, I understand this, the fact that this is a black baby and we're not going to have this black baby in our family ruining the family dynamic and potentially putting us in, in li our lives in danger just based on the fact that it's a black child. So um, it just, th that to me, I would have loved to have Dr. Welsing around just to get her perspective because I know she would have had quite a bit of insight on this particular story. But um, just powerful, and I just don't know where you find these things, but you find some really great ones. Thank you. I'll mute my line. Appreciate that, Bros. I thought with that adoption clip too, the dad, uh, Mr. Sandberg, at first he said that we assumed, like when she asked him, did you all make a preference? Did you say that you wanted a white baby? And he said, no, we just assumed that the baby would be white. But later in the interview, when they were talking, it, it seemed as though they they knew that the child was, quote unquote, biracial. Uh, and then the child got darker. And it was, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, we got to send we got to send this one back. Uh, that just seemed like a slight discrepancy uh, in the reporting. Uh, if other folks uh, that had a hand up, if they had commentary they wanted to share. Uh, line should be open. Proceed. Oh, yes. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Oh, yes. Thank you very much, sir. Greetings to Gus, the host, the listeners and callers. Uh, I, I, had, I had two questions. Um, I think that was uh, it was a, a nearly fuller uh, sound clip, and I, I think it was talking about Snow White, and uh, I guess it was from that movie where I guess the dwarves, he said, was cleaning up something. And, like, I didn't catch what, like, what did he what did he mention about, I guess, when she came into the house. And I guess she was trying to, to was she trying to dress up or something? What was it he was saying? I believe he said that uh, she would clean up the house and clean up herself and the house. Uh, and then she's looking for a partner, but she doesn't want, you know, the little dwarfs she wants the handsome uh prince to come and you know take her out of all this and the thing that she's got for going for her is that she's white i think that was the gist of what he was saying oh okay 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 gotcha gotcha um like i wanted to also uh like uh, point out there was a term i heard i'm not sure which audio clip it was um uh, it might have been the adoption one or was another one, but that like the term rut was used. Like I was thinking about, I know I had used that term for a workplace racism incident. What I was looking at in the context of it is that I was looking at some uh, documents of juvenile, like juvenile arrest reports and uh, like on the skin description. It had freckled, it had, um, you know, fair, and it had ruddy. That was one of the terms. And, like, I never had heard that word before. And I guess it referred to uh, something dark, I'm assuming. But that was the first time that I had heard that term, and then it came up again. Um, 
that was another part of the uh, audio where I guess it was at one of the schools because racism definitely seems to be uh, very widespread, permeating through the uh, area of education. Um, I guess it was some students that, some white students that was uh, posting something online or something. And I don't know if they went into detail about how the parents uh, had that conversation. I think they were supposed to have some kind of meeting. And I believe that was a uh, non-white victim who said, like, I thought that they were my friends. Like, I mean, he sounded genuinely shocked. Not like when, you know, when I hear that, like, that's what I think ignorance is. Um, like that clip that I had, I heard on here one time, like, if anyone's ignorant about racism is black people. Like, that's an example of that. Um, and he was, like he said, he said he thought they was really his friends. And it's that's very interesting that um, apparently he must have been talking about some somebody that, he, I guess he may have been talking to, I don't know if he was asking any more questions about who he was speaking of. He just said, you know, like they, you know, he thought they were his friends and he just um, ended up having a, or experiencing a revelation of uh, what they truly think and their behavior. And uh, there's going to be a lot of, not even people of that age group, but people who are older or whatever the age is, uh, that um, racism is dominant or white supremacy is dominant. And, you know, it's just uh, we, we all need to definitely um, face the reality on that. And uh, that's all I have for now. And uh, thanks for allowing me to share. Appreciate that caller in Florida. Uh, that term, ruddy, uh, it's defined having a healthy Red color, a cheerful pipe smoking man of ruddy complexion, the accompanying sentence uh, to help give some context for how that word is used. I frequently hear that term used. I think most of the time when I hear it used, they're talking about uh, someone's complexion, uh, skin pigmentation. When I hear that term being used, not always, but generally Uh, and the confusion I said the same thing when I heard that segment, the one he's talking about, the school in Tennessee, where the little white children, they were sending text messages talking about they wanted to hang the black students and white female students who were dating black guys, cowbell. Uh, But he said that he that they wanted to or the black students specifically, he said, yeah, I thought they were my friends. And he said it with such confusion. It sounded like some real anguish, like this was my white friends. These was my homies. Ben, we, you know, been kicking it and listening to Kanye West and everything. And he's talking about lynching us like what confusion. And that was twice in the sound clips, the very first clip that was talking about former Congressman John Conyers. They said the Congressional Black Caucus was in a state of bewilderment, confusion, anger, uh, consistently keeping black people confused about what is going on and principally about what racism, white supremacy is, how it works, what it means to be white. Excellent. uh, The illustration with the students, especially excellent illustration of uh, black people being confused about what racism is. Uh, other folks who dialed in, if you have a hand up, uh, if you have commentary you want to share, if we've not heard from you at all, feel free. Your line should be open. Oh, did we miss anybody? We get everybody. All the folks who called in with a hand up. Or are we missing folks? While we're waiting, make sure I get in the number again, 641-715-3640, the code 564-943-POUND. Press star 61 if you would like to participate. Not only will we be here on Monday continuing the topic of maternal mortality rates, resources 
for Black mothers or expecting uh, Black parents. Uh, that should be Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We should also be here on Wednesday. We should have a, another white person. Always grand to have white guests on the program. Uh, he, uh, David Newert, I believe that's how you say his name, N E. I W E R T Newart, I think that's it. Uh, he wrote the book Alt America, just came out, where it's weaving in the history of white supremacy in uh, this area of the world and how that walked us to the Donald Trump presidency currently. Uh, just came out. He had a report, uh, it was kind of a short article based on the book that was just published in The Guardian uh, a couple days ago, but he should be here on Wednesday, normal time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, I know. One of our callers uh, was talking about the so-called Me Too movement and all of these accusations of sexual misconduct and how all of this is, is going to develop. Uh, now, John, uh, Congressman John Conyers uh, stepping down. People are probably not even going to remember or talk about with his legacy from this point forward, his efforts to get reparations for black people. It's just going to be that he, for decades, was a sexual tyrant and those accusations might be true i don't know totally incorrect if he was engaged in that behavior but i know there are tons of whites we talk about thomas jefferson all the time that is not how they lead with their legacy as this is a raping racist terrorist it's oh he was the president and did the constitution and all this and maybe we'll get to sally hemmings and all that other stuff down the road that is not how they function with whites that's what it's going to be for John Conyers. All that other stuff is going to get pushed to the curb. And yep, he was a no good, lecherous, raping, sexual predator for years. And uh, we're glad we got him out of there. Uh, we get miss any other folks? Still stack spe- spe- spectator? Can I hear? Yes, sir. Uh, howdy, duty, everybody. Uh, this is uh, Ken Steele. I am in uh, Long Beach, uh, California. And uh, I just wanted to start off by um, saying that uh, the fires here in Southern California, I was uh, earlier this week in the city of Chatsworth. Uh, I think that's in the San Fernando Valley here in uh, Cal- Southern California. That's the area um, that it's known as. And uh, while traveling to this uh, point, uh, along the way, I saw some of the uh, fires burning, and I I thought that it was pretty interesting um, how uh, just the effect of uh, a, a brush fire has on a local area. The wind that was generated was uh, pretty eerie, and the cloud covering, it was this uh, red glowing um it it was just red and glowing and it was hot i just remember it being extremely warm at that point and as i'm getting closer and closer to chatsworth it was getting worse and worse and i was just wondering like is this place going to clear up and then it it started to clear up uh by the time i was done uh working um I, I, I stepped out and I saw that the sky uh, was orange and uh, black and that I could hear a lot of emergency vehicles. You know, it didn't really occur to me what was going on at that time because I didn't see any open flames. Uh, but when I tried to leave the area, I noticed that I couldn't leave the area um, uh, using the route that was prescribed to me by Google Maps. Uh, there was just uh, police barricades all over the place, and I noticed that there were a lot of emergency vehicles just lining up in formation and then zipping off. I'd never seen anything like this. Um, there were so many different authority figures out. I was I was nervous. I was thinking, you know, maybe I was going to get, you know, uh, uh, nabbed up or hemmed up about something, but I realized that there were just a lot of police officers, a lot of emergency vehicles, a lot of authority figures out and about. And I was really disoriented, really confused as to what was happening because, again, I just saw the orange sky. I didn't see any of the open flames. And I tried to get uh, out of the area by a path called Foothill Boulevard. And that whole path, uh, 
that whole uh, road was shut down. And I asked one of the traffic uh, guys, I said, hey, what's going on here? You know, I was thinking, you know, are we under some sort of a North Korea warning or something like that? I, I you know, I just really was kind of um, a, a bit aloof as to what the situation was. Uh, mind you, I'm from Michigan I've ne- and, and Chicago, so I've never been in a fire type situation. I didn't know what, what, what the deal was. And he said, oh, nothing. It's just a fire. I said, okay, is this fire is it uh is it bad or what what's the situation he said oh just you know 160 houses have been burnt down so far um and i said is that normal he said no it's not normal and i said oh okay well how do i get uh to chino and uh he um he, he said well you're gonna have to go all the way around and you're gonna have to find a path some other way but um, you know, I don't know how to get out there right now because all these roads are blocked off. And he listed a whole bunch of um, interstates that I couldn't get on. So, uh, you know, at that point, I, I contacted uh, a friend of mine who uh, actually was a work colleague. I, I contacted a work colleague that um, had some information on, you know, what roads were open. And I was able to find a path, but uh, what normally would have been a one hour, maybe one hour, 30 minute trip uh, ended up taking me about three and a half hours total. So um, the entire of uh, Southern California, um, uh, out, out of West, I stay in the Inland Empire mostly, but um uh, in LA County and, you know, in the, in the Valley and everything, that whole place was uh, set ablaze. And, um, it was, uh, it was all the, the ritzy titsy areas too, like, you know, Bel Air and, um, and Malibu and, you know, just uh, a lot of really, um, a lot of, uh, uh really, uh, wealthy areas and, and places and hills were, were being affected by this uh, this rash of brush fires that just started out of nowhere. So that was um, really interesting. I, I thought it was noteworthy uh, at how the um, authority figures were behaving. Um, you know, I could see in that scenario that anything uh, it was kind of anything goes. Um, I, I I felt as though they could have easily just started pulling people over and confiscating vehicles or or doing any number of things. It was just, um, it was very strange, very disorienting. And, um, and yeah, that was the first time I've ever been in a massive disaster. Um, oh, also I was coughing the whole time, like, uh, even on the drive home, um, when it seemed like I was away from the smoke and, uh, everything, I couldn't turn on uh, my AC because it was blowing, um, it was blowing smoke from all the, um, the fires uh, in my face, and I just, uh, it, it was uh, it was pretty bad. It was pretty bad. I didn't really get over everything um, until maybe midday the next day. I didn't feel back to normal. And, um, yeah, I feel, uh, I feel kind of bad for uh, uh, the people living in these, uh, environments and I feel really bad for the victims that are affected by this as well. Um, I know that uh, Tariq Nasheed was caught up in this whole thing and he posted up videos of that. So I, I don't know. It, it was a, it, the, the fires here are, are very um, terrifying. They move very fast and uh, they're consuming people's homes. So um, what you see on the news is, um, is actually happening out here and the, the images are, are just as cool. Um, and uh, I think that's what I'll, I'll stick to reporting uh, for now. Um, I might have a, a few other things to, to touch on uh, later um, in the program. Thank you so much. I'll meet my life. Man, hope you're able to stay uh, safe, Mr. Steele. I uh, know they are having historic fires. I think they've said it's been like thousands of acres uh, have been destroyed with the fires and the evacuations and what have you. The wind has made it uh, way worse. So I'm glad you made it through that safely. I hope you're able to remain safe. I'm sorry to hear about uh, Mr. Nasheed. I hope he's able to remain safe. No major property damage or anything like that. Again, uh, if we have any listeners uh, who are in that area, I hope you all uh, are safe as well. But yeah, it looks 
pretty bad uh, from the images and images and reports that I've seen and read over the past few days or so. They've had lots of those fires on the whole West Coast. I know they had some uh, in, I think, the Vancouver area over the summer and Oregon, Washington State as well over the summer. I think the whole western coast of the United States has had a lot of those fires over the past six months or so. Uh, do we have other folks who have a hand up that we've not heard from uh, at all? If you have a comment. Thomas in New York, greetings, sir. Greetings, Gus. Greetings to all the callers. I'm sorry to hear about that. Well, I did see um, Harry Hashid um, speak about the uh, forest fires and um, how fast they were evacuating people from this area. So he was back in his home, but um, it's a terrible situation to be in. Uh, something I couldn't even fathom, like this, so like far out, so far out of the realms of possibility living in Manhattan, you know, where there's no trees, to just see in an area where, you know, houses are just burning. Um, Michael Slager, 20 years on a plea deal, I mean, I don't think he was uh, necessarily charged with murdering this man. It was, it was something worked out, you know. Um, he could have got between five and thirty years. He ended up getting twenty. Um, and um, the way the families gave him, even though it could be played, they weren't as forgiving. In some of the clips I've seen, it was um, gave me that Dr. Wells and the nauseating feeling. Um, so sort of like on um, the families after the Mother Emanuel Church shooting. Um, the clip with the black woman who was adopted, and then. Um, that's too black for the white family. You know, I, I really, man, that, that could maybe irk the side. Um, you know, making those white people feel better about their racist decisions, um, I, I felt and it was a lot of white validation and a lot of um, validating whites, you know, um, whites receiving that validation. It, it just was um, a terrible clip. I felt terrible for the lady, you know, as her. Uh, what her life came in, um, I don't know if it would have been much better with that white family. But uh, it kind of made me think of that clip. I mean, I uh, guess you had before. He might have came on more than once. He had a white mother, and um, he tried to pass him off his um, um I, I don't know if you remember this guy, Gus. Dave Myers, he lives right yeah. here in Washington State. Yes, sir. Yeah, he was the only um, mixed race person I've ever seen like really talk bad about the white parents, you know. But I mean, after hearing his stories, I guess he had no choice. But um, kind of gave me that feeling about my man, Mr. Myers. Um, here in New York City Council, um, did not um forced the black lady to resign. However, they tried, and uh, the mayor kind of made it very clear way before the hearing that he was not going to um, take any action against her. He was very happy with the job she did. This is the black lady. I, um, she has a, a, a name that's hard to pronounce, but um, she she um, signed off on getting all this money for the lead poison inspections, and the lead poison inspections uh, were not um, done. Either way, um, she admitted and, and to kind of, um, you know, clean her thing up where she came with these statistics showing that lead poison only affects kids six years and younger um, on a higher scale. So all the houses of children six years and younger were checked, but none of the other 90,000 were, which was just um, terrible. But either way, the next day, the federal government sent the black lady up um, to look into the situation, and they had a press conference. And um, they, this, the same lady who signed off and took this money, she blames being cost for all of this. It's like he wasn't even there. Um, but um, either way, I just felt like it was a lot of showcasing and, um, you know, have these black people fight. Now, not, mind you, the two white people, uh, who were fired, um, got to resign with all their work they resigned, well, they were the ones in charge. They were the ones in charge of these inspections. Like, and then they, they were able to resign with their pensions. They're not going to jail. And they're not at none of these press conferences owning up for all of this. It's just a bunch of black people fighting over it. Um, have a workplace racism. 
which is um kind of out of you know bounds. I was um, in the operating room, and as I told you before, it's an older white lady. Um, she's not an American white. She's from Poland. And um, she's, I, I feel like um, she, she makes a lot of very sexually explicit comments, especially to her black males, um, genitalia. And, and I, I think I even reported that she um, said that she wants to work at the black hospital because she likes to see the black men naked while they, you know, Either way, she comes up to me and um, she asks me if um, I knew anyone who could help her. So I'm like, help you do what? So she says, well, um, she, she had told me the story before about her living situation and her neighbor who um, she can't stand. And um, the neighbor calls her Dirty Polak. And um, I said, well, what's your neighbor? She's a... Um, She's a half Russian and half German or something, and her, her boyfriend is Italian. And, you know, this ethnic thing works big with these white people. They're all white to me. But either way, she wanted me to, to have some people I know um, go and um, she'll pay them to beat this guy up. And I'm like, whoa. You know, like, oh, you, you know, so she has this look in her eyes, like, you know, like, she's dead serious about this. Like, um, and I'm like, well, you know, I mean, is it that is it, does he still, I don't know, I let things die down for two years. I haven't spoken to them, so they won't even think it's me. And I'm like, um, you know, I don't know anyone that said, oh, of course you do. You know, I'm, I'm like, no, nah, I don't know anyone, who, you know. You know, so I just, like, walked away, but I just felt like that was um, extremely interesting. Last thing I wanted to say, um, a lot of talk on this, um, of course, the opium addiction of whites. So I've been doing some research on it, and um, what I found, well, first, uh, according to CBS, the drug overdoses killed more Americans last year than the entire Vietnam War did. So that's um, pretty big, because that was a deadly war. 60,000 people died last year alone from drug overdoses, um, opium drug overdoses which I thought was um, compelling. Um, now, um, I, I want to compare this to the crack epidemic because I saw an article um, that, that was making a comparison to these two, two things. And um, in the mid to late 80s, I call it the crack chemical war campaign, um, imposed on black people, um, headed by um, George Herbert Walker Bush, the vice president at the time, uh, on behest of Ronald um, Reagan. Um, and um, y'all should look up George Herbert Walker, um, his grandfather. Um, the death rates for overdoses in that era uh, reached a high in America of two people per 100,000 people. And this was in the mid 80s, mid to late 80s, um, and it was uh, considered an epidemic then. Now, by comparison, opioid epidemic killing 10 people per 100,000 people, 10.3 people. And um, in some states, the overdoses are worse than others. So the top 10 states was West Virginia. There's 41.5 people per 100 people. Um, New Hampshire, 34.3. Ohio, 29. Kentucky, 29. Rhode Island, 28. Pennsylvania, 26. Massachusetts, 25. New Mexico, 25. Utah, 23. Tennessee topped it out at 22. Um, Tennessee is the only state with a significant black population. Um, Ohio has 12 percent, Pennsylvania 11, but Tennessee has 17 percent black, which is higher than the national average. So these are, this is definitely a white thing. And, and I mean, when you look compare that to two people going to crack to 41.5 in West Virginia, this this is like, <laughs> I don't know what else they're doing with their time other than shooting up. Um, um, this is to um, show that how they're pushing the numbers up. And I make my observation based on experience on cannabis use and listening to hip hop, trying to push our numbers up. Um, and um, they list the heroin deaths per state 
and they don't include, so they mix this up with the opioids. They don't just say, oh, this is all opioid deaths. They put it for heroin, and then you have another one for morphine, another one for oxycodone, another one for fentanyl, another one for hydrocodone, and um, ironically, they don't list codeine, um, the codeine itself, and that's what the black youth seem to be on is the codeine. Um, so I think that that's interesting because they're kind of excluding the uh, opioid that a lot of our overdoses is coming in from. And um, we listen to the hip hop music, all of these um, oxycodone, which is Percocet, and they call it Perkies in the rap. And um, you know, you hear alarms about bikes and, and veins, that's hydrocortisone. Um, you know, of course, the lean and the drink, that's the codeine. Um, and I just think that, um, you know, the way they're doing that is terrible. I'm listening to some of these songs and just to think of how it influenced, you know, my generation to, to use me, smoke weed and, and get high. Um, I'm listening to this um, rapper, Little Uzi Vert, and um, he's talking about Xanax, which is a, um, not an opiate, but it's like an um, anxiety drug that calms you down, kind of gets you that down effect. It's a downer, like an opiate. But um, he has in his song, you know, I might blow my brains out. Zanny numb the pain, yeah. Please, Zanny, make it go away. I'm committed, not addicted, but he keeps controlling me. I mean, I'm listening to this, and this is, they're playing this on the radio, like, I remember in my era, they would bleep out the drug references and some of the um, curses that they allow to play. And um, I'm listening to these young kids singing this. And um, I can just imagine if they have an opportunity to just take this little pill in a sip of water, if they would take it, um, they probably would. And I'll make my line. Thank you. Appreciate that, Thomas, in New York. Sobriety would be best. Absolutely. The chemical biological warfare uh, under the, the guise of drugs long running. Uh, those are pretty lofty statistics, having more people die from the uh, heroin epidemic or opioid epidemic uh, than all of the folks who passed away or were killed during the Vietnam conflict, at least the U.S. casualties. That is uh, striking. Wow. Uh, do we have other folks who... One year. Just one year, Gus. Just one year? 2016, more people died from the opioid epidemic than they died in the entire U.S. Um, Vietnam War just in 2016. Wow. Striking statistic. Whites, and that would have to be a lofty number of white casualties uh, of the opioid epidemic, absolutely. Uh, did we have other folks that we missed completely? Any other folks who dialed in with a hand up that we've not heard from at all? Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Greetings to you, the hosts, the callers, and the listeners. This is Mahandi C. I would say, um, well, yeah, we, we definitely should be comfortable with the enemy dying or the enemy not being here or something that's taken out the enemy. We should definitely be comfortable with that. Um, and I, I remember uh, I was on Facebook um, some time ago and uh, one of the one of the people posted a prayer from uh, Mr. Gus, and I thought that was a very beautiful prayer, uh, just basically asking uh, God or the Creator to help black people be comfortable. I believe he was saying be comfortable with white people leaving this earth, and I think we really need to get comfortable with that. I think we need to start praying for that. Uh, we just, I think people need to start verbally, out loud, asking for the universe, for the creator, to get rid of white people, the enemy that is killing us every single day in so many ways we don't even understand how they're doing it. Um, the other thing I wanted to talk about was chemtrails. I noticed uh, for a number of years that I've, I've, I've heard about chem, chemtrails and have been following it, or chemical trails that come from the airplanes. Uh, I've noticed that they've, especially like in the summer, I, I noticed the planes will start coming out around, I don't know, around 10 a.m. or something like that. 
between 10 a.m. and uh, 2 p.m., you know, the peak times of, of where the sun is giving you the most energy. Uh, and that was interesting. But what was even a little more interesting to me was that I seen chemtrails during the night, especially when there's a full moon. And my sister, uh, she, my sister had told me um, while she was in a uh, debate class, or de- in doing her debates in uh, college, some uh, one of the white people w- was telling her <laughs> that they could still get sun cancer from the moonlight, and I thought that was well th- that that entertained me. Uh, the other thing is, um, well, well, with the chemical trails, what they're what they're doing, of course, is trying to block the or they are actually effectively blocking a good portion of the sunlight to cool down the environment. And these chemical trails also form clouds. And then so the clouds block the sunlight. Um, and if we could figure out a way to move those clouds out the way, that would, that would improve our health because we need the sunlight to survive. And it also would improve our condition because white people die in the sunlight. Uh, thank you. Appreciate that, Imhan DC. Uh, people used to write in uh, prayers as well. I had said that before. I would read some of the prayers that listeners wrote in. Folks can do that as well if they want to write their own prayer out. We can read that on the program. We also had people who volunteered to do the prayer at the end of the program as well. Uh, I did want to say really quick, Thomas in New York, uh, where his workplace racism situation, anytime where something like that, where you're just having simple conversation on the job with another colleague, especially if it's a race soldier and it heads into that area where it gets to something tacky, where she goes to, I'm having some sort of conflict with my neighbor or whatever it is. And maybe, you know, some goons that I can hire to come and beat these people up. I would start walking immediately uh, because uh, when you just stay in the area, then they can, Oh, sure. You know, somebody. And I just want to get some people to show that I'm I'm tough and we mean business. So they'll leave just start walking like, oh, man, <laughs> I can't help you with that at all. I'm going to have to talk to you later, Mary. I got to get back to work and just start walking. Uh, it's nothing. It's no more to stay. It's nothing to chat about. Walk. Uh, that's one that I employ anytime it looks like things are going to go into that sort of tacky, uh, non-constructive direction immediately. You're just walking. You say what you got to say and start walking and do not stop. Do not break stride. Just keep rolling. Even if they keep talking, I got to go. I'll just have to talk to you a little later on. Have a good afternoon and keep rolling. Uh, other folks uh, that we, if we have not heard from you at all, anybody that we missed completely that had commentary they wanted to share? Do we nab all the callers or get everybody making sure we haven't missed anyone? Uh, greetings, Emmy. Did you have commentary? Can I be here? Yes, ma'am. Your volume is a little low. Mm. How about now? Is that better? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. Um, a couple of things. Um, I agree, I think, with Ms. Puff, um, with the re-traumatization. Um, I feel like that's essentially, or there's enough evidence to suggest that that's essentially, when we talk about art, what it is, some sort of a re-traumatization process. Um, our genesis begins with slavery, and that's all we ever know or will know and suffering, that kind of thing. So I agree with that. Um, the information that the um, the female caller who, I don't know exactly what she does, but she does, works with drug trials, that was really helpful. Um, I didn't know, like, I didn't consider the phases. I hadn't looked into it, but I didn't consider the phases. I um, mean, it does make sense you would start to make sure that, you know, you move, your first phase would be like human to make sure it's safe. And then I know the third phase was like dosing, which I thought was cool. So I was, thank you for that. Um, gave me something to think about. Um, I could be totally uh, incorrect. I might've missed it, but I felt like that was probably the longest, most difficult clip I've had to listen to uh, in the compensatory call, the one with the adoption, I felt like the white people were just talking forever. And I was just like, oh my goodness. Um, 
And I was taken aback by how long it, it appeared to me that it took way too long to get to the point. Because I kept wondering, are they even going to, like, name this person? Or, like, did they find this person? Like, what's going on? How does this end? What's up? It just seemed very long. Um, I don't know if it's really, I don't know. I'm, I've, I'm not adopted. Um, so, you know, VGQ for what I'm about to say. But I'm not so sure. Like, I feel like Black self-respect could have also been not showing up. Like, what do I need to meet these people for, this man for, at all? Like, no. Um, I mean, okay, so then if you still went, I, then maybe even another level of Black self-respect would have, like, I mean, just to look at him if you wanted to look at him. like. But I'm not so sure why he needs to die in peace. I don't know. Um, I, again, I could be totally incorrect. And then the white female... Um, I don't know what, like, what, I don't know what that whole dynamic was. I don't even know if the white mother even really cared that much. I feel like white people lie so much. I don't believe anything I just heard at all, other than this one white female who, who knows, has, like, no meaning for her life, decided she wanted to go and seek out this black female who went and lived her life, albeit with whatever has happened, you know, but went and did her, was not thinking about these white people who, you know what I mean? So now she can get on a radio show. That's what I feel like. Um, and uh, it's just been my observation that white people use black people. I really, um, manip- I don't know, I was going to use a metaphor and it just seems so fitting, but manipulate black people for other games. And I know that seems so basic like duh, but anyway. And so I, I was uh, disgusted with the entire clip. And um, the fact that the white people were even taken aback that she referred to herself as a black dress or minimized what she had experienced to some type of thing. I even was also wondering, I mean, like, yeah, the metaphor is not the most constructive thing, but by turning yourself into an object, I think it spoke kind of clearly to exactly, you know, what's up. Um, the Her self-objectification, I'm not saying that, you know, she was correct in that, but that's how they treated her, like a thing. And um, that's how we're all treated, in my opinion, uh, like things, not people. And, um, yeah, I mean, I do, like, I, I know... I agree with the other callers who mentioned like her uh, not allowing them to pull her into a negative space about her experience. Like kudos to that. I do think that's black self-respect, but there was a lot of other things going on. Um, And I really don't see what would have been constructive about having that conversation at all. Like, thank you for reaching out, but I'm good. So anyway, that was just a couple of the things. Like, I had very mixed feelings about the clip, and I was really annoyed for a really, really long time, and then just sad once she started speaking. So um, I was at work, and um, what once was a safe space for silence has now become uh, he wants to talk. The pharmacist wants to talk. I don't know why, but he wants to talk. But it was interesting. Um, I'm grateful for the cows for many, many things. Um, I've always loved questions, like even before the cows, but learning how to ask the right questions and learning how to spin it once the question, like once someone starts asking me questions and being, um, I don't know, like on my, not on my toes, like being alert enough to turn this conversation back around. The pharmacist, oh, so getting to the point, I was going to say he's not white, but apparently he is calls himself Egyptian, and so um, he's giving a flu shot to some white women who ask him, so where are you from? And he says, Africa. And she goes, really? <laughs> and I'm just, I'm going to mind my business. That's what I said, I'm going to mind my business. So, and he goes, well, Egypt. And then she goes, oh, okay, I couldn't tell from your accent. So they start talking, blah, 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 blah. Well, he comes back, now it's on his mind this conversation. And um, 
begins to ask me these like very stupid questions about, well, why do people get hung up if someone asks you where you're from? And I'm like, you're either stupid or you think I'm stupid. So here we go. Um, I was smart enough not to get caught up, but I got good information and here it goes. So I can wrap this up. Although he is, and this is speaking to the level of confusion in non-white people, although he is non-white, he considers himself white because he's in that part of the world. He's allowed to bubble in white. White people don't treat him like he's white um, or they're unsure of where to place him, which is why she asked. He could have said some other part that had a really like harsh accent, um, but she wasn't really sure. Like she was trying to figure out, is he white or is he not white? That's the real question for anything. Are you, you know what I mean? Or not, do you know what I mean? But that's how I feel. And um, so it's interesting. Both of the pharmacists, uh, one pharmacist is from Ethiopia. The other pharmacist is from Egypt. The one that is from Egypt is very light-skinned. And the one that is from Ethiopia is very light. He's my complexion, very brown-skinned. Now, when he began to talk and talk and talk, I said, okay, I just asked him. I said, so are you white? And he immediately, like, react, like his reaction let me know that he... Could f he was trying to bamboozle me with a lot of talking. And then he wanted to take forever to answer the question, which is yes. Then when I said, well, how are you white? Then he wanted to talk about how he and the other pharmacists would be considered of the same race. Then he went into Christianity, sons of Ham and Sam and whomever else and tribes of Judah and whatever. And so, but the other pharmacist is a very brown person. So then I said, so does he mark you know the white bubble and then he got all you know reserved and whatnot and so the whole point of what i'm saying is number one don't talk about race at work the information i got was interesting i have been ruminating on it um because i've always been considering like who are these people who get to bubble in white in in egypt um i just met one like i'm working with one so now i know he's you know i don't really know how all the white people respond to him but if he's thinking he's white i'm gonna treat him like he's white um, secondly, that there's an assumption that you know nothing about anything. Play that up sometimes. Um, and then lastly, that we're all just really, really, really confused. And it's just really, really sad. Um, I agree with uh, Muhandisi, um with a couple of things that he said over the, over the times that I've heard him. But I do think that there's some, a lot of truth in saying certain things out loud like, I can fix this problem. This problem can be fixed. Thank you all for listening. For sure, Emmy. Appreciate that. Uh, black female caller in New York. Did you have a uh, commentary you wanted to share? Oh, yes. Thank you, Gus. Um, greetings to all the uh, listeners uh, and the callers and the, the audience. And I just want to repeat what Emmy just said we are all just really, really, really confused and it is really sad. And that is a perfect uh, introduction to what I witnessed today in, uh, no, last weekend. I wanted to call in, but I couldn't because I was stuck in traffic again. Um, I was in a store uh, and there was a black woman in the store with me and we were just looking around at some things and she was very, very uh, well-dressed. Um, just, you know, nothing over the top, just really, really nice, re just really nicely. And um, there was a white sales person. And um, apparently um, she had some kind of status in this store where she could get somebody to be her personal shopper. And this white woman, you know, was, uh, it was her lucky day. <laughs> she got to be the personal shopper for the, uh, this victim of racism. So while I was looking around, my back was turned, and I heard this white personal shopper say to this black woman, oh, look at you. Your shirt matches your pants exactly. And the thing about it was that it was like a shade of pink that you would never normally see. It wasn't like really pink, 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 but it was like a grayish pink. So she hooked it up. You know that. You know how we do. So she hooked it up, and it looked really nice. She says, your shirt matches your pants exactly. 
So the black woman said, thank you. She said, and then the white woman said, and I quote, it looks really nice on you. And I'm not happy about that. (laughs) She said it just like that. Immediately, it was like, I mean, every little hair on my body stood up because she sounded like some sort of serial killer. You know, so her pathology was just on display. And then she said, uh, and then she said again, I'm really just not happy about that. And the black, me, I would have just said, no, no, she said something about it makes me feel, she said it makes me feel really bad. That's exactly what she said. It makes me feel really bad. And the black woman must have acted like she didn't hear her or, or she was traumatized or she was afraid or I don't know what it was, but um, she continued to just do her shopping. And I thought to myself, had she said that to me, I would have said to her, if you're feeling really bad, can I call your manager and let them know that a customer has made you, a customer's clothing has made you feel, or my clothing has made you feel really bad? I would have came at her with a question just like that. Um, But the pathology of white women who, and I've had it like up to, I don't know, to my, to my split ends with them, uh, uh, for the past few weeks is, um, yeah, it's, it's really, uh, something that, uh, it's the sickness and I'm kind of catching up to, uh, the readings on, um, the book club and, um, on the book that, that everybody is reading. And I'm reminded of, a video that I saw, and I'll try to look for it and um, email it to you, Gus. The video that I saw on YouTube where um, Dr. Layla, Layla, Layla Africa is explaining the breaking down the um, biological, chemical makeup of these people because of the conditions they had been in, being in the caves and being around each other, that um, they are incapable of um, showing any kind of um, um, humanism or 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 of decency or or uh, things that black people just do innately. That chemically, because of things in their blood and the, the amount of ammonium and all kinds of other things that he goes into, and this is the reason why this pathology is on display. This is, this is something that is innately in them. So when I hear somebody say to uh, somebody who's supposed to be a customer who's spending good money that this really makes them feel bad, I believe it. I believe that inside she just, it's, it's sickening to her. Just like we talked about the other day how they clear their throats, they get a little piece of phlegm in their throat when, they, when they're around us because you know, our vibe, something about us just really, really makes them feel bad. And it's simply because that we are just, they are, we are something that they cannot be. But I just wanted to share that. And um, the, like I said, like what Emmy said, um, the confusion, I, I, again, I felt really, really bad for that, um, that uh, female victim of racism. And, and it could have been that she just didn't know what to do or... She wasn't aware that she was um, being targeted and being attacked or that she just wanted to, like, get her shopping over. She did know she just wanted to get her shopping over and get out of there. But um, I just just thought that had that been me, I would have never let her uh, get away with that. I would have caused her some kind of – I would have made her feel a little sicker. But anyway, that's all I had to uh, share, and thank you for listening. Appreciate that black female caller in New York. Uh, I think we have heard that before, particularly white women or white people in general uh, being disgusted, feeling bad, nauseous, not at ease when black people are doing well uh, or even looking like they could be moving in the direction of doing well. Like if we're not in misery and suffering and just all all kinds of trauma and homeless and all the rest of it, things are great. 
things are great. If we're singing rap songs about all of our misery and suffering, things are great. But doing well, just out trying to get a little shopping done, it makes me feel bad to see you looking so well. Just looks even give me the idea that you might be doing well. I'm just totally disgusted with my day. I need to tell some racist jokes or figure out if we can fire a black person uh, who works at the store or whatever. Cut their cut their hours in half for the next month. Uh, do we miss any folks, anybody who dialed in that we've not heard from at all? Uh, the person. Oh, Princess. Good to hear from you. Uh, nabbed. Wonderful. Nubian heritage soap from my wish list, which I adore. Uh, did you have commentary you wanted to share, Princess? Uh, yes, I'll try and make it quick because I'm just now getting off work, heading home, and I have to be back to work in a few hours. Uh, so, um, I just wanted to comment because, like I said, I've just been in the middle of moving, and um, my landlord is a white female, and her husband uh, is a black male, and they, I had texted her last week to do some work in my apartment, and when she came, I just noticed um, and I was sharing it with another cow listener that um, when they both came up, first of all, she had indicated that it was only going to be, she, she had indicated that she was just coming up uh, to upstairs to uh, come see what the problem was. And so when I opened the door, uh, her and her husband was there. So it was just like, okay. And, um, you know, he he said hello and this and the other and um but I noticed the whole time he never gave me full eye contact and it had dawned on me afterwards like it was almost as if he was trying to avoid looking at me directly and I I don't know is that something that usually happens in tragic arrangements that these white women uh it almost just looked like uh, he was un- on, under some type of control. And, like, she basically just, like, look here, don't don't talk, no this, that, and other. Like, he did not give me any type of con- eye contact. Uh, when I was talking directly to him, he was, uh, like, looking the other way. At, at the time, he was fixing a, a, uh, a light. Um, a hanging light or something, and like the whole time I'm talking, it's just like he was just making sure that he kept his eyes on on the light, <laughs> and I didn't know what was going on, but I just thought it was weird. I don't know if anybody can has has experienced something like that or any black males know anything about that that have been in past tragic arrangements or what the deal was because I've never seen that before. Like, he was on some serious type of mind control. Can I be heard? Yes, sir, Mr. Steele. Yes, sir, Mr. Steele. Um, yes, um, real quick, I wanted to um, bring attention to um, uh, some information that I uh, came across earlier this week. Uh, Um, Is it possible you can raise your volume a little bit? You can speak up, maybe? Uh, Can I be heard now? That is an improvement. Okay, perfect. Um, I just wanted to uh, inform the the fellow victims and listeners uh, of some information that I came across uh, earlier this week that may substantiate some um, I guess uh, theories that were put out by um, Neely Fuller um, regarding um, homosexuality. It turns out that uh, uh, suspected white supremacist uh, scientists have um, identified uh, the uh, genetic markers for homosexuality. Um, these are uh, the genes S L I T R K five and S L I T R K six. And I read this, uh, in the, uh, I believe it was the telegraph. Um, and it was also reported, um, on the daily mail, the daily mail, um, uh, 
may be a dubious source of information, but it also is um, the most popular um, news source on the internet, believe it or not. So um, you, there may be some validity. And plus, uh, um, it was uh, confirmed on a few other news outlets that I saw this on. So I've, I've triangulated the information. Um, it turns out that uh, these uh, suspected uh, racist scientists have identified these markers. Now, this is significant because if they can identify the specific genetic markers associated with homosexuality um, with their new CRISPR technology that they are working on perfecting, they can effectively erase um, homosexuality amongst uh, suspected uh, racists, and they can effectively render homosexuality a poor and black or non-white uh, affliction. So I think that is what is already being primed for, uh, for victims. I think that this is something that we have all observed, um, the heavy campaigning uh, that the uh, suspected racists are doing amongst non-white people worldwide. Um, to engage in anti-sexual behavior. So, um, you know, this is just news coming out of uh, the UK, um, mostly, that scientists have outed uh, the genetic markers for homosexuality. So how about that? Um, and I, I also uh, wanted to make a suggestion to um, victims of racism um, in our neighborhoods, uh, there are certain stores, uh, convenience stores, uh, you know, I notice this at chicken spots a lot, um, uh, gas stations uh, that operate where the attendant is behind some sort of bulletproof glass, be it the whole um, the whole uh, front counter is behind bulletproof glass or uh, they force you to uh, operate behind bulletproof glass, especially after a certain hour of the night. Um, I, you know, I just want victims to um, consider uh, not shopping at any of these stores. Uh, if the people who are um, uh, soliciting the business of the people in the community are so scared of the community that they have to uh, ball themselves, wall themselves in behind uh, bulletproof glass. Um, they don't need to be in the community. And bulletproof glass storefronts, uh, not only are they psychologically damaging, uh, they're visually unappealing, and they just lower the value of the lives of everybody that is patronizing uh, those establishments. Even the way that you can communicate through the bulletproof glass, through that little prison talk box or whatever, is dehumanizing. And we should not allow people to feel comfortable treating us like that in our own neighborhood. So please, 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 if you do have any of such storefronts, um, make it an effort to not patronize those businesses and make it an effort to tell fellow victims, hey, we're not accepting this crap anymore. Um, uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, mute my line. Thank you so much. For sure. You have to venture to the area where they stockpile black people uh, out in Tacoma to see that sort of thing in this part of Washington state uh, elsewhere where it's super, super white. They do not have those type of stores uh, with princesses uh, comment really quick. Uh, it's been my experience a lot of times of victims of white supremacy who in those tragic arrangements, uh, the white person, uh, whether it's a white woman or a white man, uh, a lot of times they will exert a lot of control over the victim, the non-white person that they are sewering, particularly to restrict that non-white person's access to other non-white people. Uh, they can be very controlling sometimes in a very refined, manipulative way. Uh, when that non-white person is around other non-white people to make sure they're not doing too much talking or bringing up racism or anything that way, especially if they think it might be some competition, like in your situation, if it's a white woman, she's with a black male, and then you're obviously a black female present to make sure there's not any competition for her, the object that she's sexually exploiting. 
Uh, that's been my experience uh, where they can just be very controlling. And sometimes that victim uh, can feel, you know, hey, I better watch, watch how I'm behaving uh, around these other black people. I mean, better make sure that I'm not giving the impression that I'm too eager or too excited uh, about being around the other black folks. Uh, that's just been my observation. Uh, we have about six minutes left. Uh, did folks have any final concise comments they wanted to get in last five, six minutes? Can I be heard? Uh, yes, sir, Roz. All right. Thank you. Um, I'll try and make it brief. Yeah, I was going to say what I find with that, too, is sometimes the um, non-white person in the relationship m- might come from a background where they actually, even though they're with the white person, they still have some sort of attraction to the non-white group. So in order to boost the ego of the white party, of course, that's the, that's the function. And you're right with the refined um, psychological domination. I agree with you on that. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up briefly is there's a, a, a documentary and it's, it's all coinciding with the book study club on uh, Charles Manson. It's called Manson Speaks. I just saw it for the first time um, this morning. And it's, it's, it's more than one part. This was part one just came out yesterday. I believe it is. And in the documentary, they're following new killings that they believe he's done. And they're trying to uh, solve these unsolved murders. So they find this one guy who actually took in the Manson family. And when they get to a point in the conversation, they ask him yeah, at one point, he said the Manson family had left his, his place in Venice beach. And then he said, they asked him, did, he, did they ever return? And he started to uh, clear his throat. And I mean, clear his bill for an extended period of time, and then he refused to answer the question. Um, so, again, it validates the fact that whenever they're in a situation that makes them sick, like almost physically sick, they'll start that, that, that clearing of the throat thing. Or if they're agitated or something's agitating them acutely, you'll see that, that, um, that ap- the appearance of that uh, clearing of the throat thing. So, thank you. I'll mute my line and give Thomas a time, uh, chance to speak. Uh, peace, Thomas. See you, too. Oh, thank you, Ross. Um, I just wanted to say, um, yeah, I listened to, um, I believe it was in the talk about the clip with the white lady who was adopted. And I was just thinking, man, if we, li- we listened to the clip one way. I think how white people would perceive that clip is, um, and if I was the average white listener, and to hear about her life and to hear the story, I would think this black woman would have been better off raised by these racists and she was raised by this black woman who attempted to raise her. Um, it, it had a tough life after the, the husband died. And that's what I would think that they would look at it like, you know, when they hear that story, they'll be like, yeah, look at that. You know, would have been better off with us anyway. Um, and um, so what um, um, Mondesi said, um, the lunar light, um, UVB light is caused, and it can cause skin cancer. And I saw a, um, a clip on YouTube where a guy was a 90 degree day and he measured the temperature in the shade and it got lower than 90 degrees. Um, and then um, when he went outside at night, it was 90 degrees that evening and he measured the direct moon temperature, the light, the, the, the lunar light, and it was um, higher than 90 degrees. So lunar light is higher, it, it actually has a heat resonance to it. Um, that that um, doesn't weigh in effect, and I believe that um, that it, they can cause skin cancer from that as well. That's probably why I see them spraying at night as well, um, too. Um, and um, that, uh, that'll, that'll be all I add. Thank you, guys. May I be heard? Yes, ma'am. Oh, I just wanted to um, chime in on what uh, Ken Steele said about the. Uh, Stores and the bulletproof glass. I remember when I lived in New York, not only did they have bulletproof glass, at certain hours of the night, these, uh, these other non-white, non-black people who, lit, who had uh, stores in our neighborhoods didn't even open the doors. So there's like a little spin mechanism. If you want to buy something from the store, the store is locked, but there's this like little spin thing in the window where, and that is also bulletproof. Where you put your money in and you tell them what you want, they spin it, 
and they give it to you. So they don't even let you in. And another observation that I made about those kinds of places, they also have some that have this counter height thing, whereas they are higher on this platform than you. So they're essentially looking down at you for you to give you, you for you to give them your money and you have to look up at them uh, to receive your goods. So that's a, a wonderful observation that um, he's made, and um, I agree that we should um, just not patronize those places. I'll mute my line. I want to say every store in my area, every um, convenience store at 12 o'clock, uh, or, you know, depending on what time, the latest two, they lock the door and they use that spin mechanism. So you have to stand online outside the store to get something, and, you know, you spin the glass, put your money in, and they're all on the upright position. I agree with her uh, that that's definitely true. Even as far as at Popeyes at at um, twelve midnight, they put down the um, the, the the glass thing. That, like um, they lift it up during the day, and then they put it down and lock it in place. So now you're only dealing with Popeyes through a window as well. Wow. They might have you drones know. doing that sort of technology in the future. Last sixty seconds. Yes, I was going to say, um, yeah, I'm from New York, so I can agree with that. That's one thing I noticed that was different between me being in New York and North Jersey versus me being in Central Jersey is that the stores just close and that's it. And when you go to, like, Jersey City or especially New York City, you're going to find that plexiglass. Um, Chinese food stores will be open all night, plexiglass, and it's just everything that um, that uh, Ken Steele said was completely accurate. I'll mute my line. And we should not be patronizing them. Right on. Uh, with that, we will conclude the broadcast. Uh, we will be here on Monday. Uh, again, resuming our conversation on black maternal mortality rates. I know some of our listeners uh, think that this is uh, another racist, another bit of racist deceit where they're lying and putting out false information, uh, false uh, suggesting black females are having these health problems that are not really true. Uh, so we'll make sure to explore that on Monday as well. Uh, but normal broadcast time, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. You can check out the website for Black Mamas on Bedrest uh, for tips, links, suggestions. Uh, get a preview of what we'll be talking about this coming Monday evening. We'll also be here uh, this coming Wednesday, also at 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. We'll have a, another white guest on the program. Always great uh, to take opportunities to sharpen questions uh, when we get an opportunity to speak to racist suspects. Uh, thanks, to everyone who called in, listened. Hope it was a constructive investment of your Saturday evening. Uh, again, strongly recommend sobriety would be best under conditions of white supremacy. They just had a report in the Seattle times. It was a black male. <clears throat> he was shot and killed by enforcement officials. They had a settlement where they awarded his family. Uh, I think it was over $10 million. It was substantial. That obviously does not do anything to resurrect uh, this murdered black person. Uh, but they were giving some of the details in the trial and they said that, unfortunately, this uh, victim, uh, he was under the influence. He had been drinking just before the shooting happened. And just again, if we can remove some of these variables that contribute to the terrorism, it's a lot of evidence that race soldiers, whites in general, they have greatly benefited uh, and exploited a lot of black people who were under the influence and might not have been able to make the best decisions. Uh, I think Dr. Welsing. Many of the other folks that we esteem, they would strongly recommend, hey, let's be sober. Let's do everything we can to preserve our brain computer, our sanity, whatever we have left, uh, our mental health, spiritual health. Leave all of those poisons and narcotics. Leave that stuff alone. Uh, let's see if we can come up with solutions to solve our problems, not any sort of drugs to help us forget about our problems. Racist man, racist woman, racist child. It is the holiday season. I know they got holiday parties and all that nonsense going on. They had SantaCon today uh, posted about that. Another day of total debauchery in NYC. Uh, understand race soldiers are probably going to be out looking for opportunities to ticket black people, particularly uh, let's do everything we can to minimize that, especially if you're going to be out and about in a vehicle, sober 
and buckled up. Everything we can possibly do to minimize contact with the likes of Daniel Holtzclaw and other race soldiers, Michael Slager included. Uh, That's it. Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Thoughts and prayers to any of the non-white people, black people who are in harm's way in the state of California and thoughts and prayers to Pam. Hope she is healing, recuperating quickly. Context of white supremacy signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. I'm a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm -hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned.